On the way to work, I couldn't get rid of the conversation that my wife started at dinner yesterday. It wasn't the first time she'd asked about it, but it seemed like the topic was becoming more common. I was puzzled as to why she kept bringing up this issue and why it seemed so important to her. She was wondering how many women I had been with before we committed ourselves to each other, and whether I had thought about them or fantasized about them during our intimacy. It was clear that there was only one possible answer to this question, a firm and decisive no. Over the five years of marriage, my wife and I have built a solid foundation based on trust, respect, love, and friendship. Our relationship was all I ever wanted, a harmonious combination of everything that really mattered to me. We both had successful careers, a beautiful house in a great neighborhood, and a deep bond that I considered unbreakable. My name is William Harrison, but you can call me Billy. I am lucky that I have both the means and the time to treat myself to a vacation and enjoy fine wine, food, and entertainment. My wife Molly and I love exploring new places and enjoying the wonderful things in life. Tall, with blonde hair and blue eyes, I am of Nordic descent with an admixture of Irish blood, which can sometimes spur my temper. But since school, I've learned to control my anger, realizing that words are stronger than fists. I'm proud to be in good shape and take care of myself. As a child, I was always active, playing football and hockey all year round and spending countless hours in the basement lifting weights. Despite my busy schedule, I still found time for jogging, playing in the adult soccer league and hockey on the pond. My wife, Molly, has always been naturally attractive. Sparkling eyes, flawless skin, and an attractive smile. She has a charm that endears people to her and encourages them to open up to her on any occasion. Molly is a great listener. She always shows her friends and colleagues how much they mean to her by giving them her undivided attention. Molly had a magnetic power that attracted people to her. Her sociability and charm often led to conversations bordering on flirtation, but she managed to avoid inappropriate topics. Despite the attention she attracted due to her attractiveness and lively personality, Molly never allowed herself to be superfluous. Tall for a girl, with blonde hair, blue eyes and a figure that turned her head, she was the envy of both men and women. Perhaps her most impressive feature were her legs and perfectly chiseled hips. She devoted four or five evenings a week to the gym to maintain their elasticity and tone, finding pleasure and relaxation in training. I often couldn't resist the urge to touch her when she passed by, and she didn't seem to mind. When I thought about it, Molly's personality seemed perfect, especially for me. There was only one small flaw, because of which we periodically quarreled emotionally. Molly rarely brought a situation to an argument, but as a rule, she was adamant when she decided something. She firmly believed in her opinion, especially in those matters that were not easy to back up with facts or clear evidence. This often led to stubbornness on her part, and it was difficult for me to convince her when the decision was made. We both tied the knot shortly after graduating from college, having been in an ongoing relationship for the last two years of university. It's safe to say that before we got married, Molly didn't have many different sexual partners. But in high school and the following summer, as well as in the first two years of college, I had a wild streak. I wanted to sleep with as many women as possible. At the age of 19, I was lucky enough to become one of the first intimate partners of an elderly divorced woman. She was experienced and passionate in the pleasures of love, taught me valuable lessons on how to please a woman, and the secrets of how to help her reach a climax. Her guidance helped me prioritize my partner's satisfaction ensuring that I would only get my own pleasure after I made sure she was completely satisfied. Molly asked about my ability to satisfy her, and I explained this with valuable lessons learned in past relationships. Although she appreciated my skills, she couldn't help but envy the variety of partners and the experience I was getting. In my career, I worked as a mechanical engineer at Abbott Labs, I enjoyed working on the design and testing of injection molded parts for medical devices such as ventilators, infusion pumps and respirators. This job was both challenging and rewarding, 
provided me with a comfortable income and enough free time to pursue my hobbies. I am currently restoring a Winnebago B-Class van that Molly and I plan to use for week-long trips along the northern shore of Lake Superior in Minnesota, as well as to the mountains and to the ocean. The possibilities for adventure are endless. Molly, a chartered accountant, held a prestigious position in one of the five leading national accounting and consulting firms. Her job provided a comfortable salary, an acceptable level of stress, and the possibility of periodic business trips. Her responsibilities included accompanying the junior accountants at the company's audits to ensure that they conducted a thorough assessment and complied with the company's standards for customer service and reporting. Over the past month, Molly has traveled several times on business trips with a new colleague named Nick. After graduating from high school, he went on a three-year journey to become a financial controller. After their first trip, Molly initially praised his hot, confident, and sociable character, but then became silent about him. As I devoted more and more time to my project, my anticipation of traveling with Molly grew, but I couldn't get rid of the feeling that she wasn't as passionate as I was, and that bothered me. After a few short trips, I realized that eventually Molly would start to enjoy them. I also noticed that Molly's behavior towards me had changed a little. She seemed less cheerful, sociable, and companionable. Despite this, our intimate relationship remained strong, and there were times when Molly came home late from work and passionately offered to make love. The last time this happened, I noticed that her desire level was high. It was clear that something was turning her on. After making passionate love at the end of a long day at work, I went downstairs to start cooking dinner while Molly took a shower. While I was cooking, I had a feeling that something was wrong between us lately. When Molly finally joined me at the table, I decided to look into the matter. Meanwhile, Molly was relaxing under the jets of hot water, enjoying the aftertaste of our intimate moment. But underneath her contentment was a sense of guilt and worry. She couldn't get rid of the memories of the recent happy hours spent with her colleague Nick. Lately, he had been trying to persuade her to go out to dinner and dance. She was well aware that she was crossing a line that she shouldn't have crossed, especially since their conversations were becoming more and more flirtatious and inappropriate for a married woman. But she couldn't deny that she was deceiving herself. She was fixated on this forbidden relationship and the excitement of intimacy with another man. She recognized her strong physical attraction to him and had already made a mental decision to enter into an intimate relationship with him. She told herself she deserved it. I need to get this obsession out of my head and focus on my marriage. Billy had a lot of intimate partners before we started living together, but I know he would never cheat on me. I will never cheat on him either. But I made the decision to spend the weekend with Andrew. I need to figure out how to talk to Billy about this. I love him and would never want to hurt him so I will be honest and honest with him. It's just one time, just an affair. It's important for me to solve this problem and move forward in my marriage, Molly reflected. If Billy really loves her as much as she thinks he does, he will be open to this conversation, and together they will be able to overcome any difficulties, becoming even stronger than before. She did not lose this hope, although some part of her was afraid that this might just be wishful thinking, Determined, I waited for Molly to join him in the kitchen, where I was making shrimp salad, cornbread, and pouring wine into glasses. Taking a deep breath, she finally spoke. We need to discuss something important. Billy, please, let's be honest with each other. I love you and I know that you love me. Let's go through this together. I need to talk to you too, but why don't you continue? And Molly, that sounds a little ominous. How many relationships have changed for the worse after I heard those words? I spoke. Don't worry, Billy. There's nothing wrong with that. This is something that will benefit both of us. I do not know how to put it into words, but it seems to me that something is wrong between us. Lately, you haven't been as affectionate and open with me as usual. Molly began her reflections. Have you forgotten about the passionate love we just shared? I asked in disbelief. Billy, that's not what I meant she replied puzzled 
but since you're talking about it, what made you want to so badly that you practically tore off my clothes? I asked jokingly. Molly's demeanor quickly changed, and there were notes of protection and guilt in her expression. Billy, if you don't like that I love you so passionately, then maybe that's more your problem than mine, she replied. I immediately caught her defensive stance and contradicted her, noticing the notes of worry and guilt in her eyes. Can't you see? Can't you tell me what's really going on? Do I have a reason to worry about you? I asked. Molly felt a pang of guilt as she realized that the conversation had gone the wrong way. She knew she needed to pull herself together to have a productive conversation with Billy. Billy, I'm really sorry. That's not what I wanted to say. I need to tell you what's going on. I want you to remember that I love you and our life together more than anything in the world. Our relationship is very dear to me, and I am deeply in love with you. Please keep in mind, Molly, that you are causing me great concern during our conversation. Are you romantically involved with someone else? Are you unfaithful to me? I started to move forward. Billy, how could you even imagine such a thing? You know that I will never betray your trust. I appreciate and respect you too much, but I need to have a serious talk with you. I'm asking you to listen to me and really hear what I want to say. When I'm done, feel free to ask any questions and we can discuss them further. My love, I want to emphasize once again that I am devoted to you and only to you. I imagine a future with you, children together, old age together, and I will always be by your side as your wife, Molly said. I have something difficult to tell you, so please listen carefully. Do you remember when I mentioned Nick, my colleague, with whom we traveled together? So I also had lunch, met with him, and had dinner. I know this may seem suspicious, but I want to assure you that this is not an affair or cheating. I may have crossed the line by not telling you how I spend time with him, but I promise there's nothing wrong with my intentions, she said. Maybe I don't feel love for him, but our communication was filled with flirting and meaningful hints. It all seemed a little cheeky, but harmless. That was until he confessed that he wanted intimacy with me. He is seven years younger than me incredibly attractive and in great shape, and I found myself inexplicably attracted to him," says Molly enthusiastically. In a fit of anger I asked myself a question. Had she given up her current relationship for him? Does she feel love for him? Has she already cheated on me? And is this his way of telling me the truth? Molly flinched at her words, realizing that they didn't convey what she really meant. Billy. I want you to know that I haven't been intimate with anyone, including Nick. It was difficult for me, but you have to understand that my love is only for you. Nick is just a young guy, I have no chance of falling in love with him. I had limited sexual experience before we met, and sometimes I feel like I missed the opportunity to explore everything before we became a couple. I wish I had a chance to try something new, like you did before we fell in love. It's hard to get rid of the idea that this young man I'm attracted to wants to make love to me. Nick and I were flirting at work today, and therefore when I came home, I felt incredibly passionate and needed your love, Molly frankly admitted. My heart started pounding and my face turned red as I realized the consequences of what Molly had just said. She quickly tried to back away, saying, Billy, that's not what I meant. I love you deeply. And being close to you is not just a physical pleasure. It's the most enjoyable connection I've ever had. But I can't get rid of the attraction to another man. I made the decision to enter into an intimate relationship with him, because I see this as the last opportunity before we start building a future together with children, a career, and so on. I think I deserve this experience, and I ask for your understanding and permission. I want to assure you right away that I have never cheated on you and will not cheat on you, and my respect for you remains unshakable," Molly said. That's why I'm asking you to let me do this. I also inform you that I have already made a decision," she said. Molly was shocked to see me hunched over in my chair, tears welling up in my eyes and running down my cheeks. That's not how she imagined it. It was supposed to be just a physical meeting, disposable. It shouldn't have made any difference. She needed to convince me. 
Billy, I only love you. I want to be with you, grow old with you. It's a purely physical connection. It's not love, she chirped. Molly begged me, trying to justify her request to get intimate sensations. She promised to atone for the rest of her life if only I would give her that indulgence. She swore that she would never change, and stressed that this was just a manifestation of her love for me. When I got up from the table, the hurt and anger in my eyes scared Molly. I hoped she would realize the damage her words had done to our marriage and relationship. How could she regard my acceptance of this request as an indicator of my love for her? It was complete nonsense. Molly, I see right through you. It's all a sham. I know what's really going on. You've already betrayed me by having an emotional affair with someone from work. You shared intimate details about us and our marriage with this man, went on dates, drank, and who knows what else. For me, this is already a betrayal. Are you telling me that you haven't moved on to the next level and slept with him yet? And now you think you can make amends by offering more love to me, spending time with me, and showering me with caresses? This is not love, but manipulation, I shouted. Billy, please stop. This is not a novel. No, I didn't sleep with him, but I admit that I kissed him several times after lunch. Maybe it was because of the alcohol, but I have to admit that the excitement of a new person ignited something in me. It will be a one-time intimate relationship, not an affair. I will never have feelings for him. I will always love only you. But I feel like I need it. And if you really loved me the way I think you would understand, Billy, this is just an affair, not love, she pleaded. I can't get rid of this feeling, although maybe it doesn't matter at all. I do not know what to do next, but I promise to fix everything, she continued to ask. Molly, I'm shocked that you even asked me this question. You've already hurt me by getting into an emotional relationship with another person. You betrayed me by discussing intimate details and physical interactions with him. The fact that you kissed him looks like the same deception as if you slept with him, I replied indignantly. Now I realize how stupid I was, Molly said. I believed that your love for me was as deep as mine for you, but I could never bring myself to hurt you the way you hurt me. I don't even know if you realize how much damage you've done to our relationship and marriage. I always thought that I could rely on you and believe in you, but now that trust has been destroyed, I said angrily. Billy, please stop being dramatic. I love you and only you. You can trust me, and that's why I have to be honest with you. It shouldn't hurt you, because this is about me, not you. It was just a senseless mistake, she replied. All right, Molly. Maybe I'll find some pointless fling too, and then you can figure out if you believe in this nonsense, I replied. I got up, took the keys and headed for the door. Billy, come back and grow up, Molly exclaimed. This is not a mistake. It will help me become a better person and give you more love and attention than ever before. Is sleeping with someone who is not your husband going to make you a better person? You're crazy, Molly, I replied. I can't believe you really think that's true. I don't understand how you can claim to love me and then expect me to accept your infidelity and move on with my life. I'll never be able to just brush it off. If you keep this up, our relationship is over. Do you understand that? I asked bitterly. Tears welled up in my eyes as I rushed to the door, got into the car, and drove out of the driveway before Molly could reach me and call out, Billy, please don't leave. Let me prove how much I love you. We can handle this together and make it better for both of us. I looked at her with a mixture of sadness and suffering, tears streaming down my face, and I drove off into the darkness of the night. It will do me good, I thought to myself. Unbelievable. What am I going to do now, Lord? Molly sat in shock, feeling depressed and anxious. How could I have screwed up like that? Why can't he understand how important this is to me and that it won't hurt our love and relationship? But she couldn't ignore the truth. It had already happened. They had never fought like this before, and Billy had never left her. She had always been sure of her love for him, but now doubts about his feelings for her crept into her soul. Reluctantly, 
she acknowledged the possibility that she had irreparably damaged their relationship. Despite this, she was already making plans for the weekend with Nick. They were going to have a brunch, spend the day at the hotel, and indulge in passionate intimacy. The evening will be filled with dinner, dancing, and even more intimate moments. She hoped that the weekend would be full of love and connection, despite the fact that she was tormented by doubts. She intended to indulge in as close a relationship with him as possible before returning home on Sunday evening and fully dedicating herself to marriage and Billy. She was sure that eventually he would forgive her. She admitted that he was in pain right now and that she hadn't explained everything to him properly. She thinks it was unfair of him to assume that she was already having an affair and get so upset about her needs and desires. Her decision was final, and she was sure that Billy would eventually come to terms with it, which would allow them to strengthen their relationship and move forward together towards a brighter future. Two hours later, when she hadn't heard from Billy, her anxiety increased. She knew he wasn't in the best of moods when he left. She was sure that he would contact her so that they could reconcile and return home to be together and show their love for each other. But as time passed, and there was no call or message from him, she decided to contact him. When he didn't respond, she left a voice message expressing her regrets. Billy, I'm sorry that everything happened like this, and that you're suffering. Please know that I love you and I only want to be with you. Let's go through this together. It was not only about their relationship, but also about their love and future together. An hour later, she left Billy a new voice message. I'm talking to you. Let's put everything in the past and work on our relationship. Please try to understand and come back to me. Getting ready for bed, she checked her phone again, but Billy still wasn't answering. She lay down on the bed and eventually fell into a restless sleep. With tears in my eyes, I went to the Hilton next door and rented a room for the night. After spending an unacceptable amount of time in the hotel bar, I drank a lot before finally collapsing into bed. Ignoring the calls and voice messages from Molly, I tried to drown out the pain that was consuming me. I still couldn't get over the shock and disbelief at her audacity when she considered it acceptable to confess her love to me and at the same time insisted on betraying our marriage vows. I was all too familiar with her stubborn nature, but it was a line that could not be crossed without consequences. It was a mistake that could have ended our marriage, and I knew I had to make her realize the seriousness of my actions before it was too late. But deep down, I couldn't get rid of the fear that maybe it was too late. Even if I managed to convince her this time, how could I be sure that she wouldn't act behind my back and repeat the same betrayal in the future? If I had allowed her to cheat on me, it would undoubtedly have destroyed trust, respect, and our marriage. I knew that if I let her do this, my feelings for her would never be the same. If I had agreed, how long would it have been before she would have found another man she wanted to be with? Won't she end up resenting me for not standing up and insisting that she belong only to me? It seemed that there were no positive options, and I began to fear that this was just the beginning of the fall. After much thought, I came to the conclusion that the best course of action would be to convince her to change her mind and join me in therapy in order to understand the reasons for her desire to have an intimate relationship with someone else. The following Wednesday morning, Molly woke up, reached out to hug Billy, and was shocked to find that he was not in bed with her. She searched the whole house, checked the guest bedroom and the sofa, but realized that his car was not there, which means he did not return home. This discovery made her very upset. After checking her phone and finding no new messages or voicemail, she decided to call him. But he didn't answer the phone. When she was about to hang up, a text notification appeared on her screen. It was from him. Molly, I'll be home at 7 today. Please eat before I come. We need to have a serious conversation about our future together. Molly rolled her eyes at Billy's dramatic message. Initially annoyed, she soon felt anxious. Was he hinting that they didn't have a future together? The thought haunted her, causing a mixture of disappointment and anxiety. She never wanted this to happen. She loved him 
and wanted only one thing to be with him. Why couldn't he understand that? Tonight she would have to make him understand that. When she was sitting at her desk at work, Nick approached her with his usual charm. Good morning, pretty girl, he said. You look good enough to kiss and cuddle. I hope we still have everything ahead of us this Saturday. Did you tell your husband? Should I be worried? Molly sighed. Nick, let me deal with Billy. Maybe he doesn't quite agree with this idea, but it won't cause any problems. Yes, everything remains in force. Our plans for Saturday remain in force, and I can't help but be happy about it, she said. Despite this, when he walked away from her desk, Molly couldn't resist sending Billy another message. She expressed her love and assured him of her commitment to their future together. An hour passed before she received a short, sarcastic reply from Billy. Yes, of course. Molly felt anger and sadness at Billy's immature behavior and the pain he was causing them both. She was sure she could fix it. She believed that thanks to her love and attention, their relationship would improve and become even better than before. On Wednesday, as soon as Molly left, I returned to the house, collected my tools and completed the remaining work on repairing the van. I have successfully installed a solar panel, completed all electrical and Wi-Fi connections, and replaced the cassette in the toilet. I filled the tanks with water and felt that by Thursday I would be able to finish finishing the cabin and prepare the car for the journey. Working on the project helped me take my mind off the constant pain and sadness. Molly was only two hours away from returning, and I spent some time browsing the internet for information about divorce, finances, and consultants, making an approximate plan of action for the future. After making a list of things important to me, I hurried to the bank before Molly returned. I took the initiative and canceled our shared credit card, opening it in my name only. I also closed our joint checking account and opened it exclusively in my name. Using funds from our shared account, I made an advance payment on the mortgage for the house for the next two months. Then I divided the remaining amount, of which 50% went to her by check, and the remaining 50% was transferred to my savings account. Having dealt with these financial issues, I treated myself to a beer and a hamburger at my favorite pub, and then prepared for a conversation at home. When Molly arrived around 6 in the evening, she noticed that Billy was still not at home, and did not know if he was at home at all. After eating the sandwich, she thought about how to approach Billy from a more positive side this time. As soon as Billy entered the house, she rushed to him, kissed him on the lips, and hugged him tightly. She scolded him for leaving without saying a word, and expressed her concern and desire to know that he was safe. Billy, please don't ever disappear like that again without letting me know you're okay. I love only you, and I will always love only you. You don't have to go through the pain alone, Billy. I'm right next to you. I thought that we were united and united, and we will always be united. But now, I'm not sure about that. A week ago, I never imagined that you could ask me to approve of your extramarital affair, and then expect us to continue living as if nothing had changed. It's hard to believe that you can claim that you love me and want us to stay together, and at the same time ask for permission to cheat. I said wearily. Billy, please don't try to tell me that I don't love you, Molly said with tears in her eyes. It's not cheating if we both agree to it and it's just a one-time affair. Stop reacting and acting so immaturely, she protested. Molly, if you want to talk about drama and immaturity, look at yourself. I see a woman I once loved, but now it seems to me that someone or something unfamiliar has taken possession of her. She's trying to convince me that she loves me, but at the same time, she wants to have an affair with another man for the weekend and then go back to what it was before, but I know it's impossible. We will never be able to become the couple we were before, I replied. How would you feel, Molly, if I went and slept with someone else and then told you it was just an affair? I asked. It's not fair, and you know it, Billy. You've had a lot of women and sexual encounters in the past, and I haven't had any. If you had done that, I would have kicked you out, and I'm not sure I could have forgiven you, she said, stunned. So why should it be different with me? 
Why don't I kick you out and why do you think I can forgive you? I said sarcastically. Tears welled up in Molly's eyes and she said, Billy, I can't imagine life without you. I have strong feelings for you and I always want to be with you. But let's be honest, Molly. Your offer is not sincere. Have you already agreed to this? Have you assured your partner that you will sleep with him? I asked. Billy, why are you distorting the situation? He's not my partner, he's just a one-night stand. I talked to him and we have plans for this weekend. But on Monday I will show you a whole new level of passion, Molly assured. You've always been the best wife a man could count on. You've been like this before, and you'll stay like this if you don't go for it. Choking on these words, Molly retreated into the kitchen with a sinking heart and sank into a chair. She looked at me with despair in her voice and eyes, begging me to understand her. Billy, please believe me when I say that I love you more than anything in the world. Please don't let this decision come between us, our partnership, our marriage. You are my husband, my lover, my best friend, the one with whom I want to share my life and create a family. You mean everything to me. Please don't let this separate us, she begged. I looked at Molly, my face showing a mixture of confusion and disappointment. Molly, you just can't figure it out. But I promise that I will try to understand and go through everything with you, I said, holding out my hand to her. If all this were true, you would never have told me about your plans for Saturday. This conversation will lead to nothing. If you keep going, it's over between us. I'll be back Friday night, I said. Let's spend this night together. Make love and cherish each other while we still can. Billy, please don't leave me anymore. We have to deal with this. Please, she begged. Friday night, Molly. I'll bring dinner around 7 in the evening, I replied. Nick will pick me up on Saturday morning. I'll tell him to pick me up at 11 in the morning. I want you to meet him, she said with urgency. Jesus, Molly. Are you really going to meet him? If I see him, I swear I'll beat the shit out of him. He's a jerk who's ruining our marriage. Think carefully before we meet on Friday, I warned. Billy, please don't leave like that. Just tell me that you're okay, that this won't separate us, she begged. Molly, I will never be able to accept that you have an intimate relationship with someone other than me. If you want to be with someone else, then get divorced and get your way with any man in the world, I replied. I won't stand in your way. But I want you to understand that your request caused more pain than you think. I have one condition under which we can move on. If you stop this affair, completely break off your relationship with him, and agree to attend counseling with me to work on our relationship, then maybe we can keep what we have. If not, then I know it's over between us. Please think carefully about your decision and give me an answer by Friday evening, I replied adamantly. Billy, please don't give ultimatums and don't leave me. Let's solve everything together, Molly persisted. Huh, yes, right? God, you never cease to amaze me, I grumbled with sarcasm in my voice. I left the room and headed back to the Hilton to get a room for the night from Wednesday to Thursday. After that, I dialed my boss's number and referred to family circumstances, as a result of which he reluctantly gave me a day off until the end of the week. Despite his curiosity, I refused to reveal the details of my situation. Molly, meanwhile, was leaning on the table with her head in her hands, depressed by Billy's departure. She couldn't understand why he was so stubborn about the situation. Despite the certainty that he would never leave her, she couldn't shake the feeling that their relationship had already been seriously damaged. Would the continuation of her plans only make the situation worse? And yet she was determined to be with Nick, consumed by a desire to be with him that she couldn't ignore. In the end, she decided to compromise with Billy, agreeing to spend the weekend with Nick, but at the same time agreeing to attend a marriage counseling session with whoever Billy chooses after that. She reached the bed, feeling the weight of guilt and regret. While she was lying in bed, a whirlwind of thoughts was spinning in her head. Billy was everything to her, and yet she offended and angered him. The weight of it all seemed unbearable. Did she really want this? She felt trapped, unable to free herself from the choices she had made. 
She told herself that she needed it, that Billy's arguments were groundless. In the past, he had sought solace in other women, and she had remained faithful. It was just a physical act, nothing more. He needed to let go of his ego and move on. After Molly left for work on Thursday, I went back inside and started packing up the things I wanted to take with me to the van, to make sure they were the things she wouldn't miss. I went to the store to donate clothes that I had never worn, and that I would not need. I moved tools, sports equipment, and recreational items that I didn't have room for to my best friend Tom's house. I also gave him some pen and ink drawings that my uncle had made. I was sure Tom would understand me. We sat down at the table, had a drink, and I talked about my situation and what choice I had. Tom's face showed disbelief as he exclaimed, Billy, you've got to be kidding. Molly would never betray you like that. She's head over heels in love with you. He questioned my decision, suggesting that perhaps there was some reason for her behavior, such as a head injury. Feeling lost and confused, I confessed, I no longer know what is real and what is not. I don't know what to do at all. In one week, my whole world collapsed, and it was like I stopped recognizing Molly. I can't understand it. The love I once had for her is being tested, diminishing with each of her lame excuses for why it would somehow benefit our marriage. She's acting irrationally, I informed Tom. Can't we just forget about it? Maybe you should go to a therapist and move on? He asked. No way. I made it clear to her that we would get through this if she didn't betray me. But if she did, then I don't see a way to fix the situation. I begged her to change her mind, but it seems to be useless, I replied. I will try my best to give her an unforgettable and amazing Friday night, in the hope that she will finally listen to reason. This is my last attempt to save our relationship, I said. Good luck. Please let me know if there is anything I can do to support you during this difficult time. Perhaps I can ease your pain and offer my help in some other way. It breaks my heart that you two are fighting like this. You were my inspiration for a strong and healthy marriage, and now it seems that both of our ideals have been shattered, he said. I never imagined that this would happen to us, I said sadly. I'm trying my best not to give in to the urge to engage in a physical fight with him, I added. But Billy, if the situation escalates and you need help to get back at him, just warn me and I'll come to the rescue. Take your time. Think about it. Stay safe, my friend, Tommy said. Oh, and I have a new phone and number. I'll text you the details so we can stay in touch, I said. Hold on, buddy, he said. See you later, brother. After that, I went to the Verizon store, bought a new phone and number, and changed our data plan to a data plan in Molly's name only. Finally, I went home. I did the first test drive of the van and was satisfied with its performance. After finishing the interior, getting new license plates and insurance, I was ready to hit the road. I cleared my home computer of all personal emails and documents, essentially wiping out all remnants of my past life. I sent emails to our family, friends, relatives and colleagues to inform them of Molly's decision and my reaction. If I hadn't been able to convince her, I would have told them that she had decided to go on a new adventure. She could have justified herself by saying that it was just an extramarital affair. She asked for my consent, and even though I begged her not to do it, and warned her that it would ruin our marriage, she went for it anyway. I hoped that I would never have to send this letter, but in case the situation escalated, I wanted people to know the truth about what happened. As proof, I also attached a voice recording made that evening. I met with a divorce lawyer on Friday, and was advised that since our incomes are the same and we don't have children, the process is likely to be simple. It was assumed that the division of property in a divorce would be equal. The only point of contention was whether my account, which had more than $200,000 in deferred tax, and to which I had made significant contributions, would be included in this section. My ex-wife was a participant in a defined benefit pension plan, which further complicated the situation. In the end, I decided that I had earned this money through hard work and did not want to risk losing half of it because of a woman who cheated on me. Therefore, I decided to take a 40% tax hit and withdraw the money before the divorce process affects my retirement savings. 
I decided to wait until the weekend, still holding out hope that I would be able to convince Molly to come out of this ongoing nightmare. As Friday approached, I felt that our entire future, our marriage, and my feelings for her were solely in Molly's hands. I could only hope and pray that she would make the right decision. On the way home, I bought shrimp, swordfish, and Caesar salad, and then I lit the grill. I made a couple of bottles of white wine, filled the fridge with ice, mixed gin and tonic, and was looking forward to Molly's return from work. She was thrilled when she came into the kitchen and saw that I was cooking. Thank God you're home, Billy. I've missed you so much and I hate it when you're not with me. Promise me you won't do this anymore. You love me. I love you. We should be together, she said with a smile. She came up to me and felt surprised and delighted when I hugged her and kissed her with a deep, gentle kiss. Molly, why don't you go freshen up and put on something attractive? Bring a glass of wine with you to start the celebration. As soon as you come down, I'll start grilling, and we can enjoy a wonderful dinner together. Let's focus on celebrating our marriage today, instead of talking about how this might be our last dinner, I said. It upsets me that you doubt our relationship. I've assured you countless times that I only love you, Molly said with a frown. This is something I have to deal with on my own. You have nothing to do with it. Let's put this conversation on hold for now, Molly, I replied. First, let's take a shower with wine together, and then we'll eat and move on to the most interesting part of our evening, I said. Mister, I hope that you will stay with me tonight and not leave me upset or worried about you. I'll be back soon in an outfit that will show how much I love and cherish you, she said playfully. Molly went upstairs to take a shower, and when she returned, I was blown away by her stunning French outfit, complete with a little white beanie. Molly was wearing a tight white blouse with a low slit, exposing most of her assets and the middle part of her body. She was wearing a thigh-length black silk skirt, a short skirt that barely covered the top of her panties, and stiletto heels. Wow, Molly! You look incredibly seductive and just stunning! I exclaimed. I can't wait for you to see the other outfits I've planned for the next few weeks of our life together, she said. But first, let's cook the food on the grill. I'm hungry, but I'm even more impatient to get to dessert, I said. With a playful wink, she demonstrated her desire. Dinner was eaten in a hurry, glasses of gin and tonic were emptied, and most of the first bottle of wine was drunk. Unable to contain my passion any longer, I picked her up in my arms, climbed the stairs and carefully laid her on the bed. When she reached for my belt and zipper, I stopped her impulses. Today everything will depend on you, Molly, I announced. I want to cherish every inch of your body and create memories of our love that will last a lifetime. I want you to truly understand the magic we share and why we are destined to be together. You are mine, and I am yours, my love. Please make love to me tonight. Let's get rid of the stress of the last few days and strengthen our love for each other, she whispered passionately. That night we shared a passionate moment. After that, she admired how contented and satisfied she felt before falling asleep. When Molly woke up at 8.30 in the morning, she realized that it was time to get up and prepare for a new day. Nick was supposed to pick her up at 11 in the morning, and it made her feel guilty, anxious, and sad. After their passionate lovemaking the night before, she had not long doubted the correctness of her choice. How could anything compare to what they shared? But despite her doubts, she was determined to see it through. When she heard him fussing in the kitchen, the smell of bacon, scrambled eggs, and coffee wafting through the house, she put on a bathrobe and went downstairs. Last night was amazing, Billy. I see a future with you filled with such moments she said as she entered the kitchen. I love you very much and I'm grateful for last night. He didn't answer right away, concentrating on making scrambled eggs. Finally, he turned to her and asked if she wanted something to eat. I think I can do without food, Billy. But thanks anyway. I have breakfast scheduled for 11 in the morning with Nick, so I want to keep my appetite for it. I need to freshen up and get ready quickly. Can you stay here so we can say goodbye? Hug and kiss before the weekend? 
she said tensely. Molly, I'm not going to beg you anymore. I just want to ask you one last time. Are you absolutely sure that you can make love to someone who is not your husband? I said, giving up cooking breakfast. Billy, please stop. It's just one time. It won't change how I feel about you, Molly replied. Looking into her eyes full of pain and sadness, I vowed not to leave until I said goodbye to her. Molly's heart sank at the sight of my agony and the finality of my words. It was like saying goodbye, like closing, and she couldn't help but shudder at the thought. But I calmed her down by confessing my love for her. She promised that everything would be fine, that this pain would pass soon. She reminded me that we were destined to be together, forever. Despite her encouraging words, I couldn't help but feel overwhelmed by sadness. How could she be so confident when I was drowning in doubt and despair? She blushed at my remark. Tears welled up in her eyes and she hurriedly headed to the bathroom. Why is he always so dramatic? Couldn't he just let her enjoy this one fling and move on? She was grateful for the opportunity and vowed to spend the rest of her days making amends to him. The experience had clearly affected Billy, and she knew she would have to work hard to ease his pain. But she was sure that in the end, he would come to his senses, because he loved her deeply and always took care of her. This time, it will be different. She took a quick shower and applied makeup, choosing a dress that was both attractive and sophisticated. Combined with thigh-high stockings and high-heeled shoes, she tried to look her best. When she came down with her bag, she realized that it was 10.30 in the morning and time was running out. When I saw that she was dressed to meet another man, it was like a dagger in my heart. Billy, are you okay? You know how much I love you, don't you? And you love me too, don't you? Didn't last night show you that we can overcome this and continue to live together? Molly's words echoed in my mind. Last night was supposed to be a special celebration of our marriage, a memory that we could carry with us for the rest of our lives, I said sadly. But Billy, please don't call her our last night together. It's unfair to try to make me feel guilty for seeking solace in a moment of passion. We will get through this and become stronger than ever, she replied hopefully. When she moved in to kiss me, I held her gently to me, looking into her eyes and comforting her. Molly, our evening has come to an end. You chose a casual weekend fling over your marriage. Those kisses don't matter anymore, I whispered softly. Billy, please stop. It's not what you think. This is the only case, and I deserve it. You've had a lot of women in the past that you can fantasize about, but I don't have anything. I have a strong physical desire to have an intimate relationship with this person and move on. It doesn't mean love. It won't affect our relationship or my love for you she screamed. Yes, Molly, it's just a one-time thing, I confirmed. Before Molly could answer, she was interrupted by the sound of a car pulling up to the entrance and a horn honking. Billy, you need to stop all this drama, she said irritably. I will be back on Sunday evening and you will still be my one and only lover, my life partner. The beep sounded again and Molly suggested, Maybe I should let Nick in and introduce him to you. Maybe then you'll realize that he's just an attractive guy, not a threat to our relationship. I felt a surge of pain and anger, but managed to keep my voice calm and answered, Don't you dare let him in here, or I'll break his nose. Her eyes widened as he clenched his jaw and clenched his fists, saying that he would cause unimaginable pain to someone. Molly recoiled in horror, her heart pounding in her chest. This was not the man she knew, not the gentle soul she had fallen in love with. Billy, please, she begged, her voice trembling with fear. Leave it alone, please. Let me deal with this, and I promise I'll come home to you safe and sound. We can get through this together. She held out a trembling hand to him, desperately trying to calm the storm raging inside him. She prayed that he would listen to her that his actions would be guided by reason and love, not cruelty and rage. Billy's eyes met hers, and for a moment there was understanding and remorse in his gaze. She held her breath, hoping that he would choose love over hate, forgiveness over revenge. 
She grabbed her bag, headed for the door and stopped to smile at me. But the suffering and despair written on my face caused her to have a sudden surge of fear and guilt. Despite this, she smiled bravely, kissed me, and assured me that from Sunday evening onwards, she would be the perfect wife and partner I had always hoped for. With a final declaration of love, she said goodbye to me. Goodbye, dear. I waved weakly goodbye to her as she left. Sitting on the kitchen chair, I was trying to come to terms with her leaving, and tears were streaming down my face. I tried my best to end the extramarital affair that threatened to destroy our marriage, but Molly seemed to be living in her own world, convinced that this was what she needed to be happy. After crying for what seemed like an eternity, I finally got up and started packing my things into the van. Starting in the bedroom, I noticed Molly's wedding rings left on the coffee table. Feeling a mixture of sadness and anger, I put them in my pocket, deciding to forget about this painful chapter in our lives. Two hours later, I packed up all the most expensive things. The paintings, sketches, and sculptures given to me by my late uncle were carefully packed, put in boxes, and put away under the double bed of the van. My initial choice of clothes turned out to be too big, so I quickly revised it and threw everything I didn't need into the trash can in the garage. As I wandered around the house, anger and sadness raged in me. My gaze fell on a wedding album filled with 40 photos from our big day five years ago. He had once been a source of joy and tranquility, but now he only evoked painful memories. Then, pouring tears over the paper, I sat down at the table and wrote my last letter to Molly. Finally, it was finished. I put the letter and the check for Molly from our shared savings and checking accounts in an envelope, not forgetting to write her name on the outside. After putting the photo album and the letter on the kitchen table, I took off my wedding ring and put it on top of the letter. With a heavy heart, I prepared to send a letter to all our friends, relatives and acquaintances, scheduling it to be sent at 9 a.m. on Monday. I won't be home by then. After leaving the door, I climbed into my van and drove away from my old life. By the middle of Saturday afternoon, Molly and Nick had already had brunch and checked into the hotel that Nick had booked for the weekend. He hoped to persuade Molly to stay on both Saturday and Sunday, wanting to prolong the time they spent together and avoid the terrible Sunday lights out. When they undressed and got into bed, Molly couldn't help but feel a surge of delight at the sight of another man completely naked and wanting her. Nick wasted no time and started physical intimacy, but Molly gently asked him not to rush, reminding him to relax and take his time. Today and tomorrow we have a lot of time to enjoy each other. Maybe I can help you relax and keep warm, Molly suggested. Molly, I'm not very comfortable doing this and I find it a little annoying. Let me take care of you. Nick said irritably. With these words he gave her pleasure for several minutes, although it was not exactly what she dreamed of. He quickly moved into intimacy and began to move vigorously. After a couple of minutes, he announced that he was about to reach a climax and called on Molly to join him. When it was over, he leaned back and lay down on the bed. Molly lay there, unable to believe what had just happened. She was far from climaxing and even felt almost no desire. Nick hurriedly got up and rushed to the bathroom, saying that he needed to clean himself up and then bring her a washcloth. Turning away from the bathroom, Molly couldn't help but think about her actions and how much pain she had caused Billy because of something that turned out to be more insignificant than she could have imagined. Grabbing her cell phone from the bedside table, she quickly texted Billy. I want you to know that my love is only for you. Please assure me that you're okay and that you feel the same way about me. I'm looking forward to our next meeting. Nick left the room, full of youthful energy and hungry for more. They were engaged in intimacy three times that day, but it was only for the third time that she managed to reach the highest point, and then thanks to her own efforts. After getting dressed, they went to dinner. The dinner was an awkward small talk, and there was no physical or emotional connection between them. The magic she had once felt seemed to have disappeared. 
After the feast, they decided to dance, but it was more like dancing with a relative than with a romantic partner. The once strong physical attraction she felt for Nick seemed to have evaporated. Despite Nick's desire to return to the room, she continued to order more and more drinks, prolonging the evening until they both got drunk and began to struggle their way back. When she got to their room, she hurriedly undressed, plopped down on the bed, turned her back on Nick, and fell asleep. The next morning, Nick was still sound asleep. She woke up with a headache. Her body was aching from what she had experienced the day before. Nick's snoring filled the room, reminding her of decisions she'd made over the weekend that she regretted. Despite the consequences, she decided to make one last attempt to have an unforgettable, intimate meeting with a young man. She hesitantly tried to wake Nick up with morning caresses, hoping to arouse desire in the bedroom. Suddenly he woke up. She wiped her mouth and turning to him asked, Did you like it, kid? When she bent down to kiss him, he pulled away and said, No way. Go clean yourself up and brush your teeth before you continue. Disgusted. She grabbed the phone and disappeared into the bathroom, closing the door behind her. She turned on the shower and lathered herself vigorously, as if trying to get rid of some invisible threat. After drying off, she sat on the toilet and checked her phone to see if Billy had answered her messages. When she got no answer, she called him and immediately went to voicemail. Disappointed, she sent a final message. Billy, I love you. Are you all right? Please reassure me that you're okay and we can move on. This situation has become an unfortunate and unfortunate mistake, and my heart belongs to you forever. I will return home as soon as possible to hug you and express my love for you. Please confirm that you are all right. After persuading Nick to join her for breakfast, she confessed, Nick, I made a mistake. Now I understand that my love belongs only to my husband. And this weekend with you showed me that no one can compare with him in my eyes. I'm going to go back to the room. I need to pack my things and leave immediately. I'll call a taxi. I don't want to see you at dinners or social gatherings anymore. And I'd rather we avoid each other at work as well. I'm sorry, but it was a huge mistake, Molly said. You wanted it so badly and convinced me to go along with it. So go back to your husband and try to forget how wonderful we had a great time together. There are plenty of women in the world who are more attractive than you and would love to be with me, he said with a grin. Nick, you are inexperienced and have no idea how to please a woman. It's time to face reality, Molly said incredulously. When she got to her room, she packed her things and left. Molly hailed a taxi and arrived home at three o'clock on Sunday afternoon. To her surprise, the huge van that occupied half of the driveway was no longer there. Billy must have finally finished it, she thought. He probably took it for a test drive or a night tour. Disappointed that she was late for the first flight, Molly couldn't help feeling annoyed that he hadn't waited for her. As she crossed the threshold of the house, a subtle change in the atmosphere caught her attention. The first thing she noticed was the absence of the oil painting of waves crashing on the Bay of Moonlight in Encinitas, which Uncle Billy had painted and which used to hang over the fireplace. Looking around the room, she noticed that other works were missing, including a sculpture of a bison by his uncle, which stood on the fireplace. A feeling of anxiety gripped her and she called Billy, doubting that he was rearranging the work. Despite the emptiness in the house, she couldn't help but voice her concern out loud. Checking her phone again, she noticed that Billy still hadn't answered any of her messages. In a panic, she dialed his number, but heard an automatic voice informing her that the number was no longer in service. A scream escaped her lips, and she collapsed to the floor in disbelief. My God, what have I done? She screamed, tears streaming down her face. Billy, how could you leave me like this? Gathering her strength, she wiped away her tears and headed for the kitchen. Thoughts of what could have happened to him flashed through her head. On her knees, she couldn't help but notice Billy's engagement ring lying on a letter in their wedding album. Sinking into a nearby chair, she carefully took the ring, and her heart ached with confusion and disbelief. 
With trembling hands, she opened the letter, and tears streamed down her face as she tried to make out the words. Molly, this is my last goodbye to you, the letter said. I may be a coward, but I couldn't look you in the eye after you dumped me. I found your rings on your dresser, and I knew it was over. You left our marriage with the perfect symbol taking off your wedding ring. You knew that wearing it meant admitting your infidelity, and you weren't ready to give up a free weekend. You seemed to believe that you could cheat on me and get back into our marriage as if nothing had changed. I can't understand how you think it's acceptable to break our vows, humiliate and disrespect me, and treat our marriage like it doesn't mean anything. A seemingly innocent weekend fling that shouldn't have affected my feelings for you. But in the end, she became everything. She made me realize that your love for me, if it existed at all, was far from matching the depth of my love for you. She didn't match what I deserved and what I foolishly believed in. You've hurt me more than anyone else. You tore my love out of my heart and trampled on it. The betrayal began long before the physical act, when you started flirting with your lover during lunch. You crossed the line of infidelity when you started kissing him during fun parties and dinners, considering it acceptable. But you dealt the final blow to our love when you decided that I would not object to your intimate relationship. How could you think that you deserve this, and that I would give you permission if I really love you? I tried to lead you away from this pernicious path, but you chose to ignore me. I warned you that our relationship would never be the same, but you rejected me as an immature and unreasonably harsh person. I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with you and expressed my desire to end this affair over the weekend in order to focus on saving our marriage through counseling. But you dismissed my concerns. I made it clear that our passionate night together would be the last if you continued your affair over the weekend, but you ignored my feelings and expected me to support you no matter what. I don't understand how you could even believe that this situation would suit me. It seems like you didn't fully understand me just like I didn't fully understand you because I trusted you. I never imagined that you could put me down like that. I could have physically fought back, but I knew that this would only lead to resentment and the gradual destruction of our marriage. I saw that you thought it was just a one-time prank. Now you've unleashed a dangerous force. If love has proved unsatisfactory, how long will it take before you find another temptation to satisfy your desires? And if it has brought satisfaction, how soon will you begin to crave it again? You probably won't disclose future cases of cheating, especially considering the current situation we're in. But I was sure that there would be more such cases and that your infidelity would continue. It looks like we'll never know about it. I can't imagine a relationship without trust. And now my trust in you has been destroyed. I will never be able to bring myself to love you again constantly doubting whether you were thinking about me or someone else during our intimacy. The moment you left, you destroyed all the love, respect, and trust that once existed between us. You betrayed our friendship and destroyed it irrevocably. I will never be able to forgive you for the pain you caused me, and I can no longer trust you and consider you a friend. Just as you ripped my love out of my chest, so I have to completely cut you out of my life, I have taken care of practical matters, including the division of our property and the payment of the mortgage over the next two months. Your share of 50% of our joint accounts is indicated in the check that is in this envelope. I also canceled our joint account and insurance. In order to move on, you will need to negotiate your own accounts. I canceled our joint credit cards, so you'll have to get your own. In addition, I took my name off the mortgage and signed an agreement to transfer the house to your name. Whether you decide to sell the house or continue to live in it depends on you, because it doesn't matter to me anymore. I also sold my car and drove away in a van, moving away from the life we once shared. I want to be honest with you because I know it will affect both of us. In the future, I plan to pawn your wedding rings in exchange for gas money, because it seems to me that they could serve me well and help me move on. It's not an easy choice for me to make, but I hope you can understand the pain and disappointment that led me to this. I took drastic measures to symbolize the end of our love. I ruined our wedding album and burned parts of the photos in the fireplace, 
I also sent emails to our friends, relatives, colleagues and acquaintances, informing them of your infidelity and my decision to leave you. You have time to tell your version of events before the truth comes out. You can start a new chapter in your life by confessing your actions. It will be a plus for you that I give you the green light for any romantic or sexual relationship you wish. Study whatever you want, although I hope you stay away from married men, since you've already done enough damage. Follow your own path to find what made you reject our relationship as old news. You have my blessing to divorce, sell your house, move in, whatever your heart desires. I don't care what choice you make, and I'll leave everything in your hands. If I'm lucky enough to find a woman who really loves me the way I deserve, then maybe I'll consider a divorce. I have decided to quit my job and withdraw my assets. At the moment, my only plan is to never see you again and turn left when I leave this place. Besides, I think I'll start all over again and try to leave a memory of you. Molly reread Billy's farewell several times, not believing that this was actually happening. As she read the words Billy had written, she noticed his tear-stained sheets. It was a painful reminder of the damage she had caused. The sight of the ruined wedding album made her feel sick, and she tried her best not to faint. What have I done? She thought, filled with self-pity and self-loathing. How could she be so selfish and stupid as to give up the love of her life for a senseless affair with a man who didn't care about her? Molly collapsed onto the couch in the living room, overcome with guilt and despair, and desperately wanted to turn back time. She was curled up and tears were streaming down her face as she cried herself to sleep. The realization that she was stubborn and fixated on fulfilling her desires for a new sexual partner hit her hard. She ignored all of Billy's warnings and ultimatums, resulting in her life being ruined within weeks. The consequences of her betrayal will haunt her for the rest of her days. Meanwhile, Billy made a spontaneous decision to drive along the banks of the Mississippi River, starting from Minneapolis, St. Paul, and heading to New Orleans. The endless hours behind the wheel only fueled his thoughts about Molly and whether he had made the right choice. But he knew he needed time before making any decisions. At the moment, he couldn't even imagine the idea of being friends, let alone life partners. If he could let go of his anger and get to the point where being with her was more important than being apart, maybe he would consider contacting her. But he doubted it would happen. The road ahead will be long and uncertain. Finding herself in a heartbreaking situation, Molly is forced to experience humiliation and torment, justifying her irrational decision to have sexual intercourse in front of her loved ones. She knew that none of them would be able to understand her actions or support her in any way. When she tried to justify herself, she realized that she was no longer able to understand even her own reasoning, let alone explain it to others. She had to admit the harsh truth that she had been fooling herself into thinking that the affair would have no consequences. She had to admit how naively she had convinced herself that this would not affect their relationship. Now she had to come to terms with the horrifying realization that her act had ruined her marriage and destroyed the only love she had ever known. Realizing the extent of her narcissistic self-centeredness and stupidity, she realized that she had to take responsibility for her actions and for how they affected Billy and herself. The fact that she had lost the respect of her family and friends was obvious as they had distanced themselves from her. Wanting to make amends, Molly contacted Billy's best friend, Tom, and asked him to give her information about Billy's location or his contact details. Molly begged him to give Billy his message of love and remorse, finally acknowledging and taking responsibility for his infidelity in their marriage. The woman was ready to do anything to restore relations with him. She wanted to express her love and longing for him. She confessed her sins and was determined to change everything. Molly promised to fulfill their marriage vows and remain faithful to him. But even with all her efforts, she didn't get an answer from him. The woman stopped communicating with him and focused solely on work and home, hoping that he would eventually return to her. 
She remained faithful to their relationship and patiently waited for its restoration. One day, about six months after what happened to Nick, a terrible incident occurred. He was beaten when he was returning from a nightclub in a drunken state. Molly and Billy reflected on the events that had happened, not understanding how they could believe that everything would be fine. Four years had passed, and Molly still had hope that Billy would come back, but he never came back. One fateful morning when Molly was about to leave for work, a man approached her and asked about her identity. After confirming her name, he handed her an envelope that read, You have been served. Without shedding a tear or showing any emotion, Molly just stood there and, slightly grinning, said goodbye to her marriage forever. Seven years after breaking up with Molly, Billy was enjoying life with his beautiful wife, who was five years younger than him, and gave birth to a healthy son, who was born a week ago. Billy was happy to become a father, he couldn't get enough of the fact that his life had found happiness and love. As for Maul, her life has changed in her life. She married a wealthy man who dreamed of an heir, but Molly could not bear a child. For the second time, Molly suffered a miscarriage, and her husband Max warned her that if she was unable to give birth to an heir, he would abandon her. After giving Molly another chance to get pregnant and have a baby, he waited patiently. Molly was desperate. She maintained a healthy lifestyle, played sports, and when she got pregnant for the third time, their happiness knew no bounds. But this happiness did not last long. In the third month of pregnancy, Molly miscarried again. A month later, Max and Molly divorced. Apparently, Molly doesn't deserve the happiness of being a mother. It's up to you to decide karma or its fate. Donna and I have been married for eight years, graduated from college together, and tied the knot soon after. Having a good job, we saved hard for our first home, even though we didn't have children yet. While I was looking forward to starting a family, Donna is not interested in motherhood. This is the only point of disagreement in our happy marriage. We first became close in college because of our shared love of bird watching, a hobby that brought us together on hikes and walks. Our intimate life, which has always been active and pleasant, began to fade about four months ago. We were always ready to try something new, but nothing too extreme. We were brought together by a shared love of bird watching, and it was something we both cherished. Our first intimacy took place in the woods and it quickly became clear that Donna prefers to indulge in sensual pleasures in nature. She was a down-to-earth girl who preferred practical clothes, abandoning fashionable underwear in favor of simplicity. Despite her laid-back style, I found her incredibly attractive with her shoulder-length brown hair and Mediterranean complexion. Her perfectly round figure only added to her attractiveness. I suspected that her reluctance to have children was caused by the fear of losing her beauty. One of the things I admired about Donna was her thick, dark hair. She hesitated to take them off, afraid that they would become even thicker, but I found it charming and sweet. I cherished her very much, despite the fact that I was absorbed in work and long hours. Donna often came home before me and changed her clothes before heading to our favorite bird-watching spot to watch the sunset. She scrupulously recorded in a log all the birds she saw, although most of them were ordinary. There was nothing interesting or unusual, but she thought it was important to keep good records. By the time I returned home after dark, I was exhausted and often dozed on the couch watching TV. My busy work schedule made me neglect my role as a partner and husband. As the days passed without intimacy, I expected her to start playing, but she seemed content with the lack of physical intimacy. This change in behavior caused me anxiety. As a child, I never played team sports, despite my parents' attempts to involve me in various activities with other children. I had a terrible temper. I easily lost control of myself and often resorted to physical aggression when provoked. But by the time I graduated from high school, I had learned how to manage my anger. My wife was unaware of my past problems with short temper, as she never seemed to provoke me the way others did. Maybe that's why I was attracted to her. My parents never discussed my temper with her. 
I've rearranged my schedule to devote more time to Donna. I talked to the boss about feeling overwhelmed, and he was understanding about it. Now I needed to focus on rebuilding my relationship with my wife. I didn't suspect her of anything, but I can tell that she is unhappy that we spend so little time together. Maybe it's time for us to go on vacation, Donna? I asked. She hesitated, and said that it would be possible to go on a little trip if I could find the time. I was thinking about a week or two, somewhere quiet and romantic, I suggested. Donna offered to spend a three-day weekend, stressing the importance of saving money for our future home. I agreed, but expressed concern about the lack of quality time spent together. I felt exhausted after work, and our weekends were filled with chores and errands. Spending time together has faded into the background compared to our responsibilities. My dear, it seems to me that you are going a little overboard. I would love to go on a little trip somewhere nearby, but a full vacation is too much for me right now. I just don't feel ready for it. Maybe I'm just too worried. I want to make sure that I'm doing everything I can to make you happy. I'm happy with you, Brian. If something goes wrong, I promise that I will solve the problems with my head. Let's focus on our real problems and not create unnecessary ones. I trust you. I wouldn't want you to start looking for someone else. When I mentioned it, she winced slightly. It was my feeble attempt to improve my marriage which clearly didn't work. I was no better at correcting a situation than I was at recognizing that something was wrong. I didn't talk about my new work schedule, and my feeble attempt at intimacy was thwarted by her headache. Before going to bed I noticed that Donna regularly goes out for walks, but no one has seen her. On a lighter note, I got my favorite Honda 250 Rebel motorcycle. The motorcycle is quiet, easy to handle and reliable. Unlike the big Harleys, it's not bulky or clumsy. I took him to work that day, knowing that Donna would be home around 4. I informed my secretary Marge that I would spend the rest of the day in the archive and asked her to call me on my cell phone when she went home. Since there were no landlines in the basement, and no one was working downstairs, I left through the fire exit at the back of the building and bolted the door to keep it open. Five minutes later, I found a place where I could park the motorcycle, on the next street. It was easy to hide there. My wife returned home at the usual time, quickly changed her clothes and ten minutes later went to the birdwatching site. I guessed where she was going, so I didn't follow her too closely. Soon, her Volvo parked in the Rainbow Mountain Main Trail parking lot, and a black BMW parked nearby. Considering our frequent visits to this park, I was familiar with the paths. Hiding the bike among the trees, I began to climb the alternative trail. Taking my time and trying not to make noise, I used my many years of birdwatching experience to my advantage. Every few minutes I stopped to scan the area with binoculars. As I climbed to the top of the mountain, the trails became uneven, noticeable, but close to dangerous overhangs. Despite the danger, it was a great place to watch hawks, especially at this time of year. The view of the valley was breathtaking, unless I was looking down. Unable to stand it, I stopped and pointed the binoculars at the valley in search of the early arrival of the hawks. The scenery was beautiful, but soon the sounds of giggling caught my attention. It was easy for someone to hide in the dense forest, but it was hard for me to notice him either. Following the faint sounds, I cautiously moved forward, listening carefully. A flash of yellow showed where they were hiding. It was the lining of her vest. Having found a convenient place with a good view, I took out my optical device with a camera attached to it. Towering over them, I could watch without attracting attention. Lying on my stomach, I remained unnoticed, and could watch for a long time without getting tired. The secluded place provided privacy and ensured that they would not be accidentally discovered. My wife's companion turned out to be Clayton Mankey. He started working at Donna's firm about six months ago. Donna met him at several corporate events, and he seemed like a nice guy who she liked. But my attitude towards him was changing rapidly. He had a beautiful wife, quiet but attractive, and two little boys who went to elementary school. I admired his children and dreamed that I would have the same children. 
I couldn't understand why a man with such an ideal family should cheat on his wife with mine. Donna quickly took off her jeans and panties. Although they were away from prying eyes, I could still hear laughter and giggles. They began to engage in intimacy, and I managed to take some pictures of him giving her pleasure. But over time, I realized that there was nothing romantic or amorous about their actions. There was more animal and primitive in them. I realized that I didn't like watching them, and my rage increased. The initial shock of what was happening passed, and I thought about intervening, but in the end decided to endure the situation without having a clear plan. When he was done, they both got dressed, and then lay on the blanket for a while. The whole visit lasted less than an hour. Donna gave him a brief kiss, more like a gesture of familiarity than romance. When she started to leave, he gathered up the blanket, and it seemed like they both decided it was better to leave separately. Unaware of my presence, she left, forcing me to quickly pack my things and follow her at an inconspicuous distance. I finally stopped at the observation deck of Hawk Mountain, a flat rock jutting out over the valley, with a sheer drop of at least 300 feet down. From a picturesque and at the same time dangerous place, there was a breathtaking view of the Hawk Mountain. I was standing there scanning the area with binoculars when Clayton came out along the path to meet me. Despite the fact that I felt a surge of anger at his presence, I kept a calm look. What are you looking at? He asked. There's a red-tailed hawk feeding the chicks in that pine tree, I replied, gesturing at the tree. Clayton tried to make out the hawk but found nothing. That tree over there studded with pine cones, I pointed out. Still not seeing anything, he walked closer to the edge of the forest and then turned to me. Do I know you from somewhere? He asked. Yes, we have already met. I'm Brian Powers, Donna's husband, I replied. His eyes widened in realization. The last words he uttered were, oh shit, before he was startled and stumbled backwards and flew down. Time seemed to slow down as he fell, and it seemed to me that an eternity had passed, although only a few seconds had passed. I peeked over the edge when my cell phone rang and saw Clay lying face down with his leg twisted unnaturally. Intrigued, I watched him closely for a while and then picked up the phone. Hi Marge, what's going on? I asked. I'm going to leave, will you stay there? No, I'm just finishing up. I'll be back upstairs in about ten minutes, I assured her. Well, I left two letters on your desk that require your signature. I need to send them tomorrow morning, Marge informed me. No problem. Thanks, Marge. See you tomorrow, I replied. It took me more than ten minutes to get back to the office, but it didn't matter since Marge had already left. After signing the letter left by Marge, I decided to go home. Before leaving, I changed my hiking boots for Oxford's, throwing them into the nearest trash can on the way. I realized that I could be blamed for this accident. Donna seemed surprised to see me back so soon. Clayton's body was discovered in the afternoon, and the evening news made headlines that visibly upset Donna. After Clayton disappeared from work, speculation arose about his whereabouts. Clayton's body was discovered in the afternoon, and Donna was very upset when she saw the news in the evening. His absence from work caused concern to colleagues as his wife reported that he had not returned home the day before. There were speculations about what he was doing on Rainbow Mountain, because it was not known about his passion for birdwatching or similar activities. Donna hesitated slightly before answering my question. Did you go up there yesterday after work? No, not yesterday. I had to do some laundry. When asked if anyone had seen anything, she replied, There aren't that many people there during the week. Then Donna suggested, I think I'd better buy a black mothball suit. I noticed her quick glance, indicating that she was upset by my lack of seriousness about Clayton's death. Apologizing, I said, I'm sorry, dear. I know you worked with him and I didn't want to take his death lightly. That night I saw Donna crying quietly in bed, but I didn't say anything. Two days later, Detective Felix Green visited me at work. He introduced himself and asked if I had time to answer a few questions. I agreed and asked how I could help. Detective Green asked about my acquaintance with Clayton Mank, to which I replied that we had met at social events at Donna's place of work. 
When I was asked about Clayton's accident on Rainbow Mountain, I said that we weren't close, but we communicated. Detective Green explained that they were trying to finalize the details of the incident. I am very sorry, but I do not know how I can help you. I didn't know this man very well. It seems that your wife was close to Mr. Mank, and we just want to make sure that you are satisfied with their relationship. What kind of relationship do you mean? I have no idea what you're talking about. My wife only worked with Clayton Mankey, and that was the end of their relationship. I don't understand what you're getting at. If you're going to say something like that, I hope you have evidence to back it up. We talked to your wife today, Mr. Brian. She was with Clayton Mankey on Rainbow Mountain shortly before his accident. This can't be. I asked her yesterday and she said she was at home doing the laundry. I don't think she wants you to know about their relationship. Damn it. You're at it again. I asked you not to make such accusations against my wife. This is not an accusation, Mr. Brian. Your wife told us this morning that she has been dating Clayton Mank for over three months. We didn't go into details, and if we did, it would be inconvenient for us to discuss it. You and your wife will have to decide for yourselves. Are you trying to say something, or are you just trying to piss me off? Please, Mr. Brian Powers, don't worry. We spoke with your secretary, Marge Schumann, and she mentioned that you were in the basement for about two hours on Tuesday afternoon, going through archived files. The rest of the time you were in your office. You left early. The guard downstairs said you came out around 6. It looks like that's for sure. I didn't pay attention to the time. I just wanted to get back to my wife. Did she tell you that I stayed there for the rest of the evening? Don't worry, Mr. Powers. Everything is under control. We're just settling some issues, so we don't miss anything. Did you know about your wife's relationship with Clayton Mankey? No. I didn't know. The main topic of conversation at the dinner table today is likely to be that Felix Green will give me his business card, apologize, and quietly leave. I was furious. It felt like smoke was coming out of my ears. Although I already knew what Detective Green had told me, it was just crazy to hear it from someone else. I threw the stapler across the room just as Marge came in. She expressed concern that I might be in trouble, but I assured her that everything was fine. My wife and I have some personal matters to resolve, so I may need you to cover for me in the next few days, as I'll be busy. That's not a problem, boss. I'm not going to solve my problems with Donna. I just want to find the best way to end our marriage. Fortunately, we do not have children, and we live in a rented house. I used to want children, but now I'm grateful to Donna for not wanting them. It wasn't even three o'clock yet, but after putting all my things away, I went out the door. Marge said goodbye to me understandingly as I left. There were $75,000 in our home account, so I withdrew $63,000 and went to a local dealer located on the next street. Two hours later, $58,000 poorer, I left in a yellow Hummer. I realized that I didn't need a new house. I needed money for gasoline for this monstrous car. Arriving at the house, Donna got out of the car and exclaimed, What the hell is this? This is my new car. I felt like I needed something more athletic. Are you serious? How can we afford something like this? Don't worry. I paid for it in cash. Where did you get the money for such a car? Did you take them from our joint account? Well, I didn't see the need for a house for a single guy, so I bought a Hummer. When we entered the house, people were already gathering on the street. Donna grabbed my hand and asked me what I meant by single guy. I think you already know the answer to that question. What makes me think about buying a house with you? Why should I continue my relationship with you at all? Brian, please calm down and try to understand everything. Listen, Detective Green told me about your connection with Clayton Mank. You claimed that you were at home, but in fact you were with him on Rainbow Mountain. Can you give an explanation for this? I didn't want to cause problems. Clayton needed someone to talk to about his family problems, because he had recently arrived in the city. I was just supporting a friend, offering him a shoulder to lean on. He was clearly upset and on the verge of tears, and the last thing he wanted to do was get upset in a public place. While I poured myself a cup of coffee, 
Donna sat silently, as if waiting for me to make a move. It felt like some kind of confusing game, and I was disappointed that she got involved in it at all. This whole situation is ridiculous, and you know it. I'm offended that you think so badly of me that you're trying to pull off something like this. You and Clayton have been in a relationship for more than three months. You were both unfaithful, you cheated on me, and Clayton cheated on his wife. I'm tired of listening to your lies and excuses. It's time to take responsibility as an adult, or keep quiet. Your made-up stories have no weight. Just because you made something up doesn't make it true. There is only friendship between Clayton and me. If you have evidence to the contrary, go ahead. I had incriminating photos that could reveal the truth. I couldn't reveal the truth about being on Rainbow Mountain on the day Clay died. Even if I showed the photos. My anger was obvious as I tried to think. My fists were clenched, and the blood vessels in my neck and forehead were throbbing. Despite having good photos, I couldn't tell Donna the truth. Are there enough photos to prove it? In desperation, I decided that these were pictures of Donna and Clay making love. But she stated that they had never had an intimate relationship. Donna's words stuck in her throat as she realized the consequences of what she had just said. The attempt to deny the truth only confirmed her, and she fell silent, her eyes full of anger, and her lower lip trembled with excitement. She refused to admit defeat, but her words betrayed her true feelings. You're a coward, she finally spat out, her voice filled with bitterness. I'm not going to discuss this any further, and you're not going to leave me. Sleep in your precious car because you won't be welcome in my bed for a long time, if at all. Cook yourself dinner and stay away from me. But then, suddenly changing her tone, she added, We're going to the funeral tomorrow anyway, right? The funeral was unusual as both Clayton and his wife Emily were not locals. It's strange that she decided to bury him away from home, perhaps to avoid having to explain the circumstances of his death to their loved ones. Most of those present were colleagues from the office where Donna and Clayton worked and expressed condolences as they passed the grieving widow. It was a dark event filled with tension and unspoken truths. When we arrived, Emily told the two boys to come over to her friend. Donna held out her hand and met Emily's gaze. You have the nerve to show up here, Emily began. You ruined my marriage, you ruined my family, and now you have the audacity to come here and take it out on me. If I see you again, I'll tear you to pieces. I promise you that. Donna was speechless, not knowing what to say. She opened her mouth to say something, but eventually gave up on the idea and just turned around and walked back to the car. Several people nearby overheard the whole conversation. I looked at Emily Mankey who was watching my wife leave. There was hatred in her eyes. I'm sorry if she upset you in any way. I'm sure it wasn't intentional, I said. Listen up. She cheated on you, and you're protecting her. What kind of weakling are you? Emily answered. Go and comfort your cheating wife. You just drove me crazy, and I don't need it right now. With a slight nod, I headed back to the car. Donna was silent while we were driving home. But as soon as we arrived at the house, she vented her anger. You're a coward, she exclaimed. Why did you force me to go to that horrible funeral just to embarrass me? There were so many people from your job there. Why did she choose you? Get out, you jerk. She came into the house angrily and didn't talk to me for the rest of the day. After that, I started sleeping in the spare bedroom. I wasn't interested in being close to her anyway so I was even relieved when she made that choice. The next day, around noon, I went to Emily Manx. I didn't know what to say, but I felt I had to apologize. She was in the garage with the boys, sorting boxes. Hello, I'm sorry to bother you, but I wanted to apologize for upsetting you yesterday, I said. She just looked at me and continued to work. Finally, she turned to me and said, Listen, I have a lot to do right now. I need to clean up the mess my husband left and figure out how to move on. I just don't have time to whine. I offered to help, and she seemed surprised. Yes, I have time, and I don't mind helping, I said. 
She told me to take some garbage bags and follow her. We entered the house and went up to the master bedroom. This is Clay's closet and chest of drawers. Take everything out and put it in bags. When you're done, you can take them to Goodwill. Can you handle it? I agreed, and asked if the boys could help me. She introduced me to Josh and Terry, and they both shook my hand, ready to help pack Dad's things. Josh looked to be about eight years old, and Terry was about six. They were both wonderful children, whom I would gladly have taken into my family. In less than an hour, the boys and I collected bags of clothes and shoes and loaded them into the Hummer. I dropped off the cargo in the city center and returned home, wondering what to do next. It's all right, Mr. Powers. You don't have to do anything else, Emily said. You shouldn't feel obligated just because of what your wife did. Do you know exactly what happened, or is it just speculation? I asked. Both, but I wouldn't want to discuss it in front of the boys. Can we talk about this later? Can you come tomorrow? I need to clean the basement and garage. Could you help me while we're talking? The boys have a meeting with friends from school. It sounds good, but I will miss the presence of the boys. When I left, I felt some relief. I regret that I didn't help Emily's husband when he backed into the abyss, but I think he deserved it. I think Emily felt the same way. I have no idea what to do with Donna. I don't understand why she's resisting a divorce. My wife was cooking chili when I got home. I wanted to talk to her before dinner. Donna, given recent events, do you think it would be better if we broke up? No, I don't think so. It's clear now that you and Clayton were having an affair. I think you weren't happy with our relationship. Can you explain this to me? I have nothing to say, Brian. After spending time with Clay at work and in other places, I realized that your vision of our future does not match mine. You thought of me as a traditional housewife who constantly gives birth to children, but I wanted something else. I didn't dare talk to you about it because I didn't want to upset you. Clayton was going through a similar situation with Emily. We found solace in each other, and this led to an intimate relationship. He wasn't taller than you. He was just unique. Maybe divorce is the best option at the moment. Based on our previous conversation, I have no plans to leave my home or end our marriage just because we had a disagreement. I intend to stay here, and I don't think you have any reason to kick me out. I think we should try to build a relationship and continue to live together as a married couple. I'm not ready to give up on our relationship yet. Let's not dwell on it anymore. Let's sit down and have dinner together. Dinner was surprisingly quiet. I quickly drank two beers to cool the hot chili. After a couple of hours, I felt stomach pains. After several trips to the toilet, I started to feel sick, and I saw blood in the tank. Donna, I feel really bad. Can you take me to the emergency clinic? Donna replied coldly. No way. Desperate Housewives is about to begin. Just take a pill if you have a stomach ache. I insisted. This is more serious than just a stomach ache, Donna. Please, let's go. I decided to drive myself. You're acting like a child, Donna said. I took the keys and went to the car. As I was leaving, a neighbor saw me and asked what happened. I explained, and he kindly offered to take me to the emergency room of the hospital. The next moment I woke up in a hospital bed, sunlight was shining through the window. Turning my head, I saw Detective Green, who was sitting at ease and reading a magazine. Good afternoon, Mr. Powers. I thought you'd sleep all day, he said. Confused, I asked him why he was here and what had happened. What time is it? I added. Hi, he replied with a small smile on his face. That's exactly what I'm asking. Just calm down and everything will fall into place. I'm sorry if I look a little worried. This is quite understandable, given the current situation. Brian, it looks like you ate some bad chili last night. Fortunately, your neighbor got you here on time. They washed your stomach and injected you with some medicine that I can't even pronounce. It looked like it was some kind of high and low pressure enema or something like that. They gave a fancy name, but it was essentially rat poison. What? I was shocked by what I heard. She gave us the leftover chili that had been tested. 
She said she had no idea where the poison came from, as she had eaten the same food herself and was fine. We searched the house and garage but found nothing. What are you going to do now? I'm not taking any action right now. A doctor and a nurse came, did some tests, and then they said I could go home when I was ready, and gave me a list of tasteless foods. I used Detective Green's phone to apologize to Emily for missing our meeting. Felix picked up the phone and asked why my wife wanted to harm me. I don't know. Or maybe she was involved in the death of Clayton Mankey? I'm not sure, but she was the last person to see him alive on Rainbow Mountain. Come on, Brian, I'll give you a ride home. When we arrived home, Donna apologized and sympathized with us, expressing regret that she had not been more supportive earlier. I went into the spare room and closed the door behind me. Since then, I have tried not to eat at home. The next day I informed Marge that I was taking sick leave and asked her to help me find a new apartment. It looks like she somehow found out about what happened. After waiting for Donna to leave for work, I began to pack my things, preparing to move out quickly if necessary. I was upset that the authorities failed to take action on the poisoning. After a quick breakfast at IHOP, I visited Emily while her sons were at school. Emily was more upset about this situation than Donna. I assured Emily that I would be back later when I had settled some personal matters. Donna didn't want to get divorced, but she had bad feelings for me. I wondered if she was motivated by revenge or money. I made the dubious decision to cash out a million-dollar life insurance policy that I took out shortly after our marriage, listing Donna as the heiress. Despite the high payments, the cost of the policy has increased to more than $16,000. Then I canceled the collision insurance and the full insurance on Donna's Volvo. In addition, I started to terminate the medical and dental insurance that I had arranged for Donna through the company. If the medical insurance was valid for 90 days, the dental insurance was terminated at the end of the month. In the insurance policies of the company, I changed the beneficiary to my mother. Marge, a supportive colleague, offered me any help. When I visited the bank manager, I found that Donna had already exhausted the remaining funds from the household fund, which amounted to about $12,000. I explained the situation to the manager and asked for advice. He agreed to arrange everything so that credit cards and checking accounts would be closed as soon as I informed him about it. I opened a new account and signed a whole stack of papers for him. I entered the house and found Donna there dressed in her birding outfit. We exchanged pleasantries, but our communication was brief. She mentioned that she was going to Rainbow Mountain to watch birds and relax. It looked like a setup, but I decided to agree. When she left, I hit the road. Her car was parked on the top landing next to a gray Ford Ranger. I quickly went down the mountain to the lower area, where her mountain bike was attached to a tree. I discreetly parked my Honda on the opposite side, hidden by bushes. Despite my dislike of uphill climbing, it only took a few minutes. Behind a ledge of rock, Donna was talking to a man. I watched as she handed him a photo and a business-sized envelope. After carefully examining the picture, he opened the envelope and took out a substantial amount of cash. After shaking hands, Donna hurried over to me. I hurriedly took cover behind a small ledge and remained motionless until she passed by. At this time, the man she was talking to crouched behind the rocks, keeping his eyes on the path leading from the parking lot. He seemed to be waiting for something, and I had a strong suspicion of what it was. Donna anticipated my pursuit and assumed that I would approach from the parking lot where she parked the car. Going down the path was faster than going up. When I got to the bottom, I noticed that her bike was missing. I decided to take the Honda and drive to the upper parking lot, where I found an unlocked Ford. Inside, in the front seat, I found the undercarriage. I took the registration number from the glove compartment, a pack of matches from the center console, and pants from a running suit. I twisted my pants tight, dipped them into the Honda's gas tank, and then repeated the procedure with the car's gas tank. Thrusting the end of my pants into the tank of the car, I quickly left the scene. Coming down the mountain, I heard an explosion. I was hoping she gave him enough money to cover the damage. On the way home, 
I may have violated several traffic rules, but in order not to collide with Donna, I drove in reverse. After parking the bike behind the garage, I took a lawn fertilizer spreader and pretended to use it on the lawn. Despite the fact that there was nothing in it, my wife, who happened to be passing by, looked disappointed. Anticipating her reaction, I quickly greeted her with a casual, Hello? Where's the Volvo? I asked in confusion. You left by car and came back by bike. What's going on? She stopped in the middle of a sentence, and then her phone rang. She turned away to answer the phone and looked slightly flustered. I couldn't hear the conversation, but it seemed like the person on the other end was excited about something. Brian, I left the Volvo on the mountain and rode my bike home to practice. Could you give me a ride back so I can pick him up? She explained. I know it sounds silly, but... But I interrupted her. Honey, it doesn't make sense. Come on, I'll take you there, I offered. She said almost nothing during the trip, clutching her fingers convulsively in her lap. As we approached the mountain road, we noticed several fire trucks heading towards the top. A policeman stopped us halfway. I'm sorry, but there was an accident on the mountain. A car caught fire and we can't let anyone in there right now, the policeman explained. My wife's car is there. Can we follow her? I asked. The officer paused. Wait a minute. We sat in silence while he was on the phone. Eventually he finished and told me to go upstairs, where an officer would help me drive past the fire trucks to get something down. Donna got out of the Hummer and assured me that I could go home as she would be fine. I thanked her and watched her head upstairs. As soon as she was out of sight, I began to follow her, easily mixing with the chaos. When she reached the top, the man she was walking with came up to her and waved his hands in greeting. I didn't hear the conversation, but it was clear that she was trying to calm him down. They argued for about ten minutes before he approached the fire chief. When they got into the Volvo, I quickly returned to the Hummer. It would take them a while to get through the fire trucks and hoses, but I had to hurry. I saw the Volvo turning the corner as I was leaving the house. I ran around the house for a while, and then I drove the Honda to Emily's place. I arrived late and apologized to Emily, who was curious to know what had happened. I told her everything in an abbreviated form. Josh and Terry were happy to see me, and ordered pizza for dinner. We spent several hours gathering things in the basement for the yard sale. The boys worked diligently and without complaint. I wanted them to be my children. Emily drove me home around nine, and I left the bike with her. Donna returned late, and I didn't ask where she had been. While Donna was taking a shower, I pulled the SIM chip out of her cell phone. As soon as she left for work, I contacted the banker to close her accounts and credit cards. I went to the cellular office to terminate its service, paying $200 for the refusal. By the end of the day, the landline phone, DSL, and cable TV were turned off. I informed the landlord of my sudden move and said he could leave deposits. I mentioned that my wife could stay and advised him to contact her to sign a new lease. Water and electricity will be cut off by the end of the week. It only took a few minutes to pack my things in the Hummer, after which I went to the new apartment that Marge had found. The note I received from Marge at the new location said that Detective Green asked me to call him. I went to the station and found his office, where he greeted me with the unexpected remark that I was still alive. Embarrassed, I asked for clarification, to which Felix Green chuckled. He seemed amused by my predicament. Have you ever heard of a man named Bobby Terrell? I can say for sure that I have never crossed paths with him. I took the registration form out of the fort and handed it to him. After reviewing the document, he noticed, very interesting, in the bad manner of Charlie Chan. We giggled together. It seems that Mr. Terrell and your wife have been talking on the phone a lot lately. She dialed his number six times and he called her four times in the last week. Besides, three days ago, your wife withdrew $12,000 from her savings account. Bobby Terrell, an ex-convict, makes his living by committing crimes. We followed him and were surprised to find a connection. Mr. Powers, is there a reason why your wife wants you dead? Yes, there was. Until yesterday morning, I canceled a million-dollar life insurance policy. 
Does she know about the cancellation? I don't think so. You are a master of your craft, and I am impressed with how you handled the situation. I suppose he was paid, but I'm not sure he'll try to fulfill the order again, because he lost his car. I wanted to let you know that we talked to Bobby. I warned him that if anything happened to you I would arrest him immediately. He didn't seem to like the attention. We also suggested that he take a break for a while, but I'm not sure that's going to keep your wife. I've already moved out of the house, but I don't know what else to do. Felix leaned back in his chair, considering the situation. I think there's something you're not telling me, Brian. All the pieces of the puzzle don't quite fit together. Just be careful. I went to Emily's right after our conversation. She agreed to have lunch with me, and I was delighted to discover that she likes sushi. I tried to explain what was on my mind, but I found that I was speaking too vaguely. I wanted to share a lot of things with her but I couldn't bring myself to do it. Sometimes she would give me mysterious looks, and instead of clarifying, I would change the subject. Lunch dragged on, but in the evening she easily persuaded me to come to her for dinner. I apologized for my unfortunate words, but she just waved me off, laughing. I felt at ease with her. The next morning, I decided to go back to work. I had a great time with Josh and Terry the night before. Emily and I had exciting plans for the coming weekend. Surprisingly, I didn't miss Donna at all. Moreover, I felt relieved that I would no longer have to deal with her. The trip to work was short, and I couldn't help but smile as I rode in the Hummer. Everything seemed to be going smoothly. The powerful car was accelerating smoothly, but when I started down the first hill, I noticed something unusual. The brakes didn't react at all. In movies, I've always criticized drivers for not being able to stop the car in such situations. I tried to turn off the key but it wouldn't budge because the car was still in gear. I had to switch to the parking lot to turn it off. The Hummer began to accelerate even faster. I kept calm and shifted the gear from drive to low, which caused a jolt and a tremor, but the speed continued to increase. As I approached the traffic jams and numerous intersections, the speed became uncontrollable. On the left side of the street there was a cemetery with a grassy bank. I headed for the shore and applied the handbrake when the Hummer spun 180 degrees and turned over on impact. Everything went dark, and I didn't feel any pain. When I woke up in the hospital room for the second time in a month, I heard myself moaning and felt activity around me. The nurse was examining me, causing a commotion in the room, and suddenly I was in pain. I was grateful for the attention, but at the same time I wanted to be left alone. A doctor entered the room, bringing order to this chaos. When I opened my eyes with difficulty, I saw Emily on the edge of the bed, and it calmed me down. After several adjustments and checks, I felt very tired and fell asleep. When I woke up again, the room was quiet. Slowly opening my eyes, I looked around the room. It was night, and the atmosphere was relatively calm. The only person present in the room was Emily, who was sleeping in an armchair next to the bed. When I turned my head in her direction, my whole body ached. Hey, are you awake? I whispered. She raised her head, smiled, and replied, No, I'm fast asleep and dreaming. Thank you for being here. No problem, she muttered, closing her eyes and falling asleep again. When morning came, I woke up feeling a little better, but still in pain. A medical team had already gathered in the room, but Emily was nowhere to be seen. I hadn't expected her presence, but her absence still weighed on me. The doctors inundated me with questions about my condition, which I diligently answered. But there was no one to ask about my well-being. I asked about Donna, who came to the hospital to sign my admission papers, but then disappeared. I was in the hospital for two days before I came to my senses. Emily visited me every day, and Felix Green constantly monitored my condition. I had a concussion, a fractured collarbone, a fractured left arm and three ribs, as well as various internal injuries that were not life-threatening. The main thing that bothered me was that I was unconscious for two days. I was very hungry, 
and eventually I managed to persuade someone to bring me some soup. I was able to feed myself and drink ginger tea, although my throat was very sore. Felix came in later, and I asked why he wasn't looking out for me. He apologized, and admitted that we didn't expect what happened. I asked if he knew what had happened, to which he replied, Well, someone messed up the Hummer by cutting all the brake lines and disabling the airbags. As a result, you punched through the windshield and broke three ribs when the seatbelt did not work. Fortunately, there was no fire, but the Hummer was completely destroyed. I never liked it, and I only bought it to annoy Donna. Speaking of your wife, have you seen her? I haven't seen her since the accident, and she obviously signed the forms before she was admitted to the hospital. How did she come up with the idea to do this? I went to her house to talk about everything. I tried to call her, but she didn't have a phone connection. When all the papers were signed, a uniformed officer escorted her home. I asked if she wanted to see you, but she refused. Has she left town? We searched her house and found a purse with almost $8,000, as well as a driver's license, credit cards, and personal belongings left behind. I doubt she left town without taking anything with her. We just think she's missing. Any idea how the Hummer was damaged? We don't know. Bobby Terrell? No, surprisingly he was in a hospital in Philadelphia. It looks like some guys took him there to make sure nothing happened to you. Do you know anyone in Philadelphia, Brian? No, to be honest, I don't know. I have no idea who you're talking about. I trust you. I have to go. Let me know if you need anything. What about the guard at the door? We both laughed. When Felix left, Emily came in. The doctor said you can leave tomorrow if you have somewhere to go. I told him that you would come to me. I have instructions on how to take care of you, including changing bandages. The nurse will visit you daily, and the doctor will examine you in a week. I don't mind. Are you or the visiting nurse going to sponge me off? I think it depends on you. Fortunately, both my legs are functioning. I can go to the toilet on my own, sit at the table and eat like an ordinary person. Painkillers made me sick, so I tried to reduce their intake as much as possible. Emily and the boys have brought me so much happiness during my recovery. I appreciated the time I spent with them. We didn't leave the house for the first week. But then Emily took me to our old house. The owner of the house was there and was eagerly watching him. He didn't receive any messages from Donna about the rented house, and he had to decide what to do with your things that are still there. We took measures that suited both of us. Marge visited me at Emily's house. She saw Emily regularly at the hospital, and they seemed to get along. I was preparing to return to work, but I planned to spend some more time with Emily and her sons. My recovery was going well, so I continued to live with Emily and her boys. After about three months, the dynamics of our relationship shifted from platonic to romantic. I quietly moved into the master bedroom, and Josh and Terry took it as a natural development. We began to spend more time together, attend social events, and even participate in parent-teacher conferences. The only problem was that I was still legally married to Donna. Despite regular meetings with Felix, there was no progress in the registration of our divorce. In the end, I made the difficult decision to go to court with a request to declare Donna legally missing so that I could marry Emily. I invited her to a cozy, intimate Italian restaurant. We enjoyed a delicious meal and a bottle of wine. When we were done, I plucked up the courage. Emily... I know it hasn't been that long, but I really believe that I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Will you marry me? I asked Emily. Is this a hypothetical question, or are you making an offer? I replied, I'm making an offer. Will you marry me? She agreed, but then added, There is one small problem. You should meet my family in Philadelphia. And then everything became clear to me. I only drank two glasses of Jack Daniels when my weekend went awry, and it wasn't even three o'clock on Friday afternoon. As a reporter for a small newspaper in the Midwest, I got a day off after working late. Hoping to take a quiet nap in my favorite chair and chat with my beloved wife, I returned home and found two cars in the driveway. 
One belonged to my wife Tracy, with whom we lived for seven years, and the other was unknown. It was strange to see Tracy at home in the middle of the day because she usually worked from eight to five as an actuary at an insurance company. Despite the strangeness of the situation, I trusted my marriage and entered the house without any suspicion. But what I found inside destroyed my world. From our bedroom upstairs came the sounds of two people engaged in intimate affairs, unmistakably determined by volume and passion. The door was left open, indicating that they were unaware of possible visitors, and the moans and screams were getting louder. Hurriedly climbing the carpeted stairs, I went into the bedroom and clearly heard their conversation. A man I didn't know asked my wife about her desires, and she answered him with audible pleasure. When I got to the door, an unexpected scene opened up in front of me. When I entered the room, I was shocked to see my beautiful wife on her back with another man who looked like a football player, who gave her incredible pleasure. It was obvious that he was satisfying her in a way that I had never satisfied her before. Despite the fact that she never expressed her displeasure to me, it was obvious that I was not meeting her needs. It felt like my world was collapsing as I watched this scene. Trying to keep my composure, I shouted, Go on, don't pay any attention to me. I took my gym bag out of the closet and started packing my things when I noticed Derek and Tracy in a compromising position. Tracy quickly apologized, saying that they planned to tell me about their affair. I couldn't help but sarcastically reply, Really? Maybe for our 10th anniversary? It was clear that this was not a one-time case. If you cared, you would have told me about it earlier. Derek stopped rocking my wife, but she was still trying to look at him while we were talking. Never mind, Tracy. I'll just take a few things and leave you. In the next few days, I will come for everything I need. I will ask my lawyer to prepare all the documents. By the way, what kind of Neanderthal is bothering you? It's pretty funny, she giggled. Derek is my lawyer. He works for one of the big firms in the city center. Great, I said. When I left the house, I didn't bother to close the front door. After putting my things in my Ford F-150, I headed straight to my favorite place. It wasn't the best way to start the weekend. Most bars are empty on a weekday, and the rusty fork was no exception. Even my favorite bartender, Noel, didn't start his shift until 4. So I just sat in my seat and thought, I should have seen this coming. The last time we went to one of my wife's work events, her colleagues barely concealed their disdain for me. And by the end of the evening, I felt that she was beginning to agree with their negative opinions about my work and my ability to maintain the lifestyle she desired. Tracy openly compared our salaries, making it clear that she earns twice as much as me. That evening on the way home, we had a tense conversation about her behavior, during which she accused me of being tipsy. I wasn't satisfied with her excuse, but I didn't hold a grudge, and after a few days we sort of reconciled, or so I thought. Now, sitting in a bar, I know that I have to take measures to ensure the safety of my finances, but right now I don't give a damn about it. My credit card is only in my name, so I can spend the night getting drunk in my car. Tomorrow I will be looking for a hotel or an apartment. Tracy and I met at a Midwestern university and dated throughout our junior and senior years before I proposed to her. We understood that if I couldn't get a job at a well-known newspaper in a big city, then she would most likely always earn more than me. But we agreed that our incomes would be shared and there would be no yours or mine. That's what I thought until recently. I'm not sure if my colleagues influenced the change in her behavior, but it seems that she stopped respecting me and maybe even stopped loving me. Today's conversation with Noel clarified my position in her eyes. He was stunned by my early arrival at four o'clock. I told him the Reader's Digest version of what I had done the day before and handed him the car keys with instructions to put me in a taxi later, but not to return the keys until tomorrow morning. He found it harsh. When a state trooper arrived at the bar around 9 p.m. looking for Mr. Simon Tillerson, he asked Noel if he was here. Of course, Noel gestured at me. The policeman slowly approached me. He could move gracefully. In a daze, I realized that he wanted to share the news that he couldn't wait to tell. 
he informed me that my wife and a man named Derek Riggs had tragically died in a semi-trailer accident in the city. The authorities searched for me for several hours until one of my friends mentioned my usual place, a bar. Confused and devastated, I shouted, The drinks are on me! There is a god in heaven, I proclaimed, eliciting cheers from those around me. But policeman Reginald Masters seemed stunned by my unexpected reaction to the news of my wife's death. Mr. Tillerson, I understand that you must be in shock, but... He began, but I interrupted him. It's not a shock, buddy. It's a delight. Stammering, I told him that I had caught my wife cheating that day. I was going to leave her, and now she's dead. The policeman looked shocked, but I didn't care. We usually prefer that the next of kin identify the body for confirmation, but I don't think Mr. Tillerson will be able to help today, Masters told Noel. Could you make sure he gets a message asking him to come to the wasteland tomorrow? Noel nodded in agreement, understanding the situation despite his heavy intoxication. I knew that even though I would miss my unfaithful spouse when I sobered up, our relationship was over. At that moment, my anger at Tracy surpassed all the love I still felt for her. The next morning I woke up in the cab of my pickup truck, feeling cramped and sick. I must have looked terrible, but I managed to get back to the bar, pick up the keys and go to the hotel. But the policeman's words from the night before came back to my mind, and I decided to drive back to my empty house instead. Thinking about Tracy and the nine years we spent together, the last seven as husband and wife, I was most upset that our relationship ended the way it ended. I wasn't particularly grieving, but I couldn't deny myself the feeling of satisfaction that she and the other participant got what I thought they deserved. After I cleaned up, I went to the morgue to identify the bodies. Tracy's body looked battered after an accident involving a semi-truck and a convertible. I asked to see another body, Derek who looked just like Tracy. I hoped his death was less painful. When I got home, I realized that I would have to make three difficult phone calls, one to my parents, one to her parents, and one to her sister Anna. Despite the fact that I was sad about her death, every memory of her was overshadowed by the image of her with her lover, and it was difficult for me to evoke sincere sadness in myself. I decided to focus on presenting the facts and keep my emotions under control. But I couldn't help but feel for Ron and Cindy Jacobs, Tracy's parents. Ron and Cindy were like family to me, almost as dear as my own parents. The thought of them going through the loss of their daughter broke my heart. I knew it wouldn't be easy to break the news to them. First, I called my parents, and my mom, being more emotional, immediately burst into tears upon hearing the news. My father on the other line was calmer and more asked for details. I reluctantly told him that Tracy was in the car with Derek Biggs at the time of the accident. I felt that he was about to ask a question, and my indecision probably gave me away. Tracy was sleeping with her lawyer friend. I finally admitted. My father being sharp and perceptive quickly caught my unspoken words. Why was she with him and not at home with you? Because she wasn't with me anymore, Dad. That day I found her in our bed with Derek and I had to leave. It was clear that this was not their first meeting, so I packed my bag and left. I do not know exactly why they sat in the car for about six hours. I think they were going to eat. I'm really sorry to hear that. It must be hard. By this time, my mom had calmed down and joined the conversation. She had heard enough to understand the situation. Are you sure she cheated on you, Simon? It's not something worth talking about if you're not sure. I abruptly interrupted the conversation and said bluntly, Mom, I caught them at the scene of the crime. I know what I'm talking about. Have you talked to Ron or Cindy yet? My father asked. I'll try to say as little as possible, Dad, unless they start interrogating me like you do. I won't lie if they ask me to then everything can turn out badly. Son, remember that you are at a disadvantage. Show them the respect they deserve. Yes, sir, I replied solemnly. Talking on the phone with Tracy's parents was like talking to my own parents. While her mother was devastated, 
Her father quickly realized that at the time of her death, Tracy was with another man when she should have been with me. Is there something you're not telling me, Simon? Ron asked, while Cindy was crying in the background. Tracy should have been with her husband at the time, not with another man in the car. It doesn't make sense, son. I was screaming and sobbing into the phone. Tracy cheated on me. I found her in bed with the man she died with, so I took my things and left. It seemed that they no longer cared what to hide, and they met together. Have you seen them together? In your house? Ron was shocked. He could not believe that his daughter, whose death he had just been informed of, had cheated on her husband and died in a car with her lover. Yes, Ron, yes. Now I am full of anger at her, and strangely enough, I am pleased that both she and her lover met their deaths. They got what they deserved. Although I regret saying those harsh words to her father, they were undoubtedly true. He started yelling at me on the phone, but I cut him off decisively. He bullied her, Ron, and that's why she started an affair, Cindy said. She demanded his attention and affection, but he did not give it to her, her parents said among themselves. I definitely don't want to be with her when my time comes. Just tell me which funeral home your family prefers, and I'll make sure the body gets there. I will take care of the organization and financial aspects. You and Cindy will take care of the rest, such as viewing. Of course, I will not be present. You can't ignore the fact that she was a part of your life, son, Ron said calmly. You and she have been together for almost ten years. You can't convince me that none of this meant anything. It's possible, and it happened. I answered. Our relationship ended the moment I caught her with Derek Biggs in our bedroom. Why should her death change my feelings? Maybe in time you'll feel different and regret not saying goodbye to her properly. Ron said softly. I doubt it, I whispered back. The funeral was held at Ron and Cindy's church, the same one where Tracy and I exchanged vows, promising to love, honor, and cherish each other. The irony of fate did not leave me. I briefly thought about going to the funeral, but anger consumed me. Have you ever felt so angry at a dead person that you wanted to strangle him? That's exactly how I felt. Going to the funeral might have comforted Tracy's parents in some way, but it would only have made my rage worse. About an hour after the service was supposed to end, Tracy's sister Anya called me. I knew it wasn't going to be a pleasant conversation, but she needed to vent her emotions, especially if her parents hadn't told her the whole story. Tracy was right. You're a terrible person. You have small dreams, a small mind, and a small future. You write for a small newspaper and have a small tool. I've always wondered why it took her so long to start cheating on you. And good day to you, Anya, I replied politely. So, I assume you've been in the loop all along. Then why did you want to see me there if I'm such a bad person? Because you disgraced my parents. You're a terrible person. How can you explain why Tracy's husband wasn't at the funeral? Everyone asked a similar question. My parents were horrified when they had to explain to the reverend why you didn't come. You were terrible, and I hope you will suffer the same fate. Now you're starting to understand, Anna! I shouted into the phone. That's how I treated your sister and her lover when I caught them. And you know what? They got what they deserved. So why don't you just leave me alone? I think this conversation was successful. I hired a realtor and immediately put the house up for sale. I moved my things into the spare bedroom and sold all our bedroom furniture, including sheets and pillowcases, on the cheap. I was never going to touch those things again. As for the rest of Tracy's things, I took her jewelry, most of which I gave her, sold them to a local jeweler, and gave the money to the church food pantry. I packed the clothes and everything else in boxes and took them to my parents, telling them that they could keep them or dispose of them as they saw fit. These boxes contained our wedding album and the usual small photos of us with each other. The image of Tracy and Derek Biggs in our marital bed was etched into my memory, and it was impossible to forget it. Ron helped me unload the boxes from the pickup truck, and when we were done, we hugged each other tightly with tears in our eyes. See you guys, I whispered. 
and my voice shook. In the first two weeks after Tracy's death, I got a call from the Cruz Miller Insurance Company. Tracy and I have always kept a close eye on life insurance, so I understood the purpose of the call. But at that time, when so many worries fell on me, this issue was not a priority for me. Now that the urgent matters have been resolved, I realized that it was time to deal with insurance issues. Tracy, who is well-versed in the insurance business, has always taken the initiative in making insurance decisions on herself. We discussed the options, but in the end, I trusted her experience and knowledge to make the final choice. One of the decisions taken was to insure the life of each of us for $1 million with the condition of double damages in case of accidental death under the age of 45. For me, that meant paying $2 million. But then the insurance agent mentioned something that almost made me choke on my coffee. It turned out that since the truck driver was the culprit of the accident, his company would be responsible for the payment in connection with the death by negligence, unless I decide to go to court and sue them to get maximum compensation. The lawyer suggested that I aim for another $2 million, but in her opinion, given the circumstances, an amount of 3 to $4 million would be more appropriate. After deducting the lawyer's fee, I should have had about $5 million in my bank account. As a result, after deducting the lawyer's expenses, I received $4.5 million, but at that moment I was so numb that I didn't care. The carrier company also entered into a settlement agreement with the widow of Derek Biggs. The signing on both sides had to take place simultaneously in the same place and at the same time. I had never met Derek's widow before, and although Tracy was a beautiful woman, Derek's widow was no less amazing. I wondered why he would want to jeopardize his marriage for an affair. Perhaps he was so sure that he would not be caught that he did not think about the risks. After completing the paperwork at the company, Ellie Biggs invited me to have a cup of coffee with her. She had a question that no one could answer, and she hoped that I would be able to give an answer. I did not know that my husband had a girlfriend named Tracy Tillerson, and when I checked, his firm confirmed that she was not his client. But they were in the car together at the time of death. It seems that no one in Derek's office knows who she is and doesn't want to share this information with me. Who was your wife to my husband, Mr. Tillerson? Taking a deep breath, I looked down at the Starbucks table where we were sitting. I didn't want to break the bad news to this extremely attractive woman. Oh, that's bad, she said as if expecting more bad news. Mr. Tillerson, I think I have the right to the truth, she pleaded. Reluctantly, I shared my version of the story with her. Her expression became shocking and disbelieving. I felt a wave of nausea wash over me. Thank you for being honest, she said, and quickly left the coffee shop. Despite my newfound wealth, my life was far from satisfying. I was not interested in dating. I was content with an ordinary apartment and had few significant connections. Working at the newspaper was my only consolation. I spent a lot of time cycling and lifting weights every week, but I was just doing my duties. My father, God bless his soul, finally convinced me to see a therapist. The therapist diagnosed me with trust issues and recommended that I communicate more and try to live a fuller life. I considered the session a waste of time and never returned to it. Now I'm sitting at home watching baseball remembering the conversation I had with Anna after Tracy's funeral six months ago. She definitely noticed that I write short stories for the local newspaper. I accepted this job for convenience reasons, as it was the only vacancy near Tracy's place of work. Since she earned more than me, I put my ambitions of working for a larger publication on hold until Tracy suggested we move. Now, having no ties to society, I realized that I could lead a free life without ever working again. I was free to write whatever I wanted, not caring about the readers. The next day, I resigned myself to this newfound freedom. I submitted my resignation to my boss, Ernie, and announced my dismissal two weeks in advance. That evening, sitting in my apartment, I was looking at my collection of books. There were about 30 of them in total, and most of them were non-fiction. 
Among the two fiction books was Moby Tool by Herman Melville. This triggered introspection, a habit that some consider risky for me. Abstract thinking has always been my strong point at school, as evidenced by various tests. Before the era of internet hyperlinks, I often indulged in such reflections in my mind. On reflection, I realized that my unique way of thinking often baffled my friends during in-depth discussions. They quickly learned not to ask me what-if questions. Suddenly, a new idea struck me. Tracy was my eternal challenge, my white whale. But instead of hunting her in real life, I'm going to do it through writing. So, I sat down at my computer and started writing a fictional story, the first since my school days. When the character of Derek Riggs died and Tracy faced severe consequences, I felt a surge of strength that had been lacking for several months. Although I couldn't get revenge on Tracy in reality, I could do it within the framework of my stories. Over the next two months, I wrote 17 more stories, each with its own twist, but keeping the theme of Derek's death and Tracy's retribution. It was a nice way to vent your frustration. When I finished a book, I always felt a sense of satisfaction. Putting it aside and then coming back to read the finished product was always a joy. One day I came across Moby Tool, a real book with a cover and bound pages. I thought, I can do this. And that's what I did. Six months later, I finished my first historical novel. Despite the fact that Derek's character had a terrible end and Tracy's character faced new challenges, I was proud of my work. It turned out that the publisher also saw potential in my novel. The deal wasn't perfect, but at least I didn't have to self-publish. Somehow, someone else appreciated my book, and the publisher even made two more copies. They wanted a second book, and offered twice as much money, and I agreed. This time I wrote a book about a mysterious crime where Derek met his death again, and Tracy got into trouble. And yet the success of my novels gave me a sense of accomplishment. Completing the book brought a sense of satisfaction into my life, and high sales figures were a nice bonus. I felt like a confirmation role seeing so many people agree with my thoughts about Tracy and Derek. After the success of my second book, another publishing company approached me, offering a lucrative offer for three books. Despite the fact that I was already rich, I decided to give my current publisher a chance to agree to this offer. They agreed without hesitation. I spent 18 months with them, preparing three additional books. Although the plot of each book was similar, I changed the scripts and even added a little humor to the third book. All three books were well received, but for me the most important thing was the sense of accomplishment that I felt with each completed book. I knew that I would never get answers to my questions about her actions, so I found solace in my work, which was the closest to satisfaction. As they say, I learned to love the one I was with. I recently signed a new contract with the publisher for three books, and this time the price has doubled. But this was not the only interesting news. One film studio was interested in turning at least two of my books into feature films. They even asked me to help with the script, which I agreed to without a doubt. Even though I'm not a big fan of Oprah Winfrey, I couldn't deny the impact of her support. When she chose my sixth book as one of her books of the month, I saw firsthand the incredible success that followed. It was incredible to see my success as an author being recognized publicly. Although there were downsides to this newfound recognition, I knew it was a success. Although most people were polite and courteous, sometimes there were those who felt it necessary to demonstrate their indifference to me. That was fine with me because I didn't need anyone's approval. I could be as rude as everyone else. I was sitting in my favorite bar, enjoying a typical Friday night with my faithful companion, when a state trooper broke the terrible news to me about Tracy's passing. Despite the fact that my fortune now exceeds $10 million, I still find joy in the simple pleasures of life, great drinking, keeping fit, cycling on the open road and the occasional flirtation with attractive women. I continue to live in my modest apartment, not wanting to have a long-term romantic relationship. Some of the bar's regulars may have found out about my achievements. Despite the occasional playful jokes, 
Most of the bar patrons usually stayed away when it came to my writing. No one mentioned that they had read my works, which didn't bother me too much, since I suspected that half of them couldn't even read. Noel, the bartender I liked the most, was aware of my achievements, and we sometimes discussed my works or projects I was working on. He was a reliable guy and didn't gossip about me, which I really appreciated. I must have had a hand in it because I always left him $20 when I visited this place. Sitting in a bar, looking at a nearby television screen and listening to background music, I was immersed in my own world when two women suddenly appeared next to me. Both were attractive, about my age, about 30 years old, dressed casually, in jeans and tops. They didn't seem to be trying to impress anyone, but there was something familiar about the woman farthest from me. It became clear as soon as she spoke to me. You don't remember me, do you, Mr. Tillerson? She asked as her friend leaned back on the stool so that we were in direct view of each other. To tell the truth, I didn't remember at first. Then it dawned on me. Standing in front of me was Ellie Biggs, the widow of Derek Biggs. I met her only once, at the signing of the settlement agreement, when the trucking company paid us for the death of the cheating spouses, and then I confirmed to her that yes, her husband cheated on her with my wife. I remember you, Mrs. Biggs. How are you? You look great, if I may say so. Ellie blushed and looked at her friend before meeting my gaze. Actually, I feel much better than the last time we talked. I have to thank you for that at least emotionally. Derek's death left me with two million dollars, but I was heartbroken when he passed away. And when I found out that he was cheating on me, I was devastated and furious. I was seething with anger and realized that I would never have the opportunity to meet with your cheating husband and tell him everything, I think. One evening, Rachel brought me your first book. She saw your name on the cover and remembered it from my story about our meeting. I reluctantly started reading only when I realized that you were writing about our disgusting spouses, and I couldn't tear myself away. When Derek's character met his death, I felt a surge of relief, and when they got what they deserved, I felt a sense of vindication that I hadn't felt that terrible day. For the first time in a long time, I felt really satisfied. I've read all your books. It may seem silly, but they cheer me up. I often laugh like a schoolgirl when Derek and Tracy face difficulties. It's like that feeling when I finish writing a book myself. I can empathize with the heroes, and I'm glad that I can help you in some way. Judging by the sales, it seems that many others can empathize with our experiences. I've never thought of writing as a career, especially since I haven't written fiction since 8th grade. After receiving the money for the settlement of the dispute and a significant amount from the insurance company, I felt that maybe that's why everything is going so easily. I decided to go with the flow as long as it brings pleasure. The three of us moved to a table, and I bought some trays of snacks so we could have a bite. We chatted until midnight, when the ladies said it was time for them to leave. I said that I couldn't remember the last time I had such a pleasant evening, and suggested that I do it again in the future. How about next Friday night? But this time we'll start with a proper dinner, at my expense, I asked. They both agreed. The following Friday evening I met them at my favorite Italian restaurant, and we had a nice time together again. Ellie was striking with her long blonde hair, blue eyes and curves, while Rachel had long black hair and a toned physique resembling a volleyball player, with long thin legs and a slender back. Rachel wore a short, tight skirt that accentuated her best features. I couldn't help but feel a little awkward when two of the most attractive women were sitting at my table. Oh my god. I couldn't believe my luck when I was lucky enough to have lunch at a restaurant with two amazing women. We had a great lunch and chatted enthusiastically while I got to know them better. But since the restaurant was crowded, I suggested that we continue our evening by having a drink at a nearby club. Rachel declined the offer, and Ellie and I went there together. The bar we found ourselves in was only half full, which allowed Ellie and me to have a quiet chat. I immediately asked her who won, her or Rachel. Did the winner get me, or the loser? 
She seemed surprised that I understood the female mind so well, and blushed deeply. I was the winner, she admitted shyly. I hope so, she added nervously. Actually I think I'm the winner but that was when you were both sitting with me. I joked that every guy in the restaurant probably wants to beat me up for having two of the most beautiful women sitting next to me. Ellie blushed even more. Can I tell you something? What is it? She asked cautiously. And you promise you won't be mad at me? Her serious look and wrinkled nose made me wary. I nodded hesitantly, not understanding in which direction the conversation would go. When I left the lawyer's office after signing the settlement papers, I despised you. I knew you weren't involved in Derek's affair with Tracy, but the fact that you found out about it before me created a sense of superiority that I didn't like. It seemed to me that you were hiding information from me and I couldn't ignore this feeling. After the death of our unfaithful partners, we met again. It was like something out of a movie, not real life. A year later, Rachel gave me a book in which you wrote, pouring out your heart about the infidelity of our spouses. It was like a light bulb for me. I finally understood what had happened. For almost a year I went to therapy with a psychoanalyst, trying to figure it all out. He immediately noticed the changes in my condition, and I handed him the book to read. During our next meeting he said, Excuse the expression, but this guy is a genius. It made me think, if I'm such a genius, then why am I living in a dilapidated house with over $10 million in the bank? Ellie was surprised. She knew about my compensation and insurance policy, but she didn't know that I was so financially stable. I explained that when you're lonely and afraid to trust others, money doesn't really matter. I am a simple man with no special vices. I don't consider my writing a job, so I don't have a traditional position. I don't have a partner with whom I can share my life or finances. When I first admitted this to myself, I realized how sad my situation was. I lived in a fantasy world where every few months I took revenge on fictional characters for their misdeeds. Although it was funny, I wasn't really living. I was just eking out an existence. I sat at the table for what seemed like an eternity, lost in my thoughts and not paying attention to the world around me. Then, as if out of nowhere, I felt a jolt of electricity on my lips. It wasn't from me, but from Ellie, who kissed me passionately. Her tongue explored my mouth, igniting a fire in me. I kissed her back greedily, enjoying every moment. After what seemed like an eternity, she broke off the kiss and told me to pay the bill and take her to my apartment. I came out of my stupor and complied with her request, feeling as if I had just woken up from a dream. In the four years after Tracy's death, I had intimate relationships with several women, but after my wife's death I didn't really make love to anyone. Ellie and I admitted that we didn't have many partners after our previous relationship. We acted slowly and gently, exchanging deep and intense kisses. Our hands slowly and gently explored each other's bodies, truly savoring every touch. It was like we were following Stevie Wonder's example. When we finally connected, the passion was incredible and we shared an amazing and wild experience. For a moment, I lost all sense of time and space. And when I returned to reality, I found myself lying carefully on top of Ellie, using my hands for support as they began to tremble. I gently turned us over on our sides so that we were facing each other, and watched as she slowly opened her eyes and tried to catch her breath. Wow, she whispered softly, looking at me. We stared at each other in silence, exchanging playful glances like teenagers. Finally she spoke, expressing her understanding of what I had shared with her. I made a sincere promise to her, vowing every day for the rest of our lives to prove that I was worthy of her trust. In response, she agreed, realizing that this was not a marriage proposal, but a commitment to build a future together. Although we didn't get married right after that memorable night, it marked the beginning of our journey together. About a year later, we exchanged vows in a beautiful ceremony, confident that we had overcome our personal difficulties. We moved into a new spacious house that we built outside the city, with five bedrooms, one for us, the rest for the four children we hoped to have. 
We built guest apartments to accommodate regular visitors, and I expanded the subject matter of my works beyond the stories of Tracy and Derek's revenge. Dating Ellie helped me realize that I no longer needed to retaliate with words, but I continued to write one or two revenge stories a year, to the delight of my publishing house's accountants, as they sold well. The success of my writing career, thanks to good karma, allowed me to take even more passengers on board the train.